हेलो हेलो वन टू थ्री
I am Havya and I will be your host for today. I am uh, very pleasured and I feel elated to be to all on behalf of uh, Yashoda Hospital Somaji Gula. I welcome you to the Yashoda Advanced and Applied Rehabilitation Program YARI, a physio update on shoulder and spine rehab in collaboration with the orthopedic and neurosurgeon of Yashoda Hospital Somaji Gula. We'll uh, shortly start the program in five more minutes. Kindly, please everyone be seated. So today we'll start up with our first presentation uh, by Dr. G. Veda Prakash, consultant orthopedic and trauma surgeon from Yashoda Hospital, Somaji Gula. Sir, can you have can you have your on the stage? muscles are attached to the scapula and they move the humeral head. 
in the humerus and consequently the arm. So you have acromion, which is important to understand in terms of pathology of your tetra cuff, coracoid process in the front, which again is useful in some surgical procedures, which we'll deal with in a minute, and various ligaments as well as tendons around it. In terms of soft tissues, you have articular cartilage of the glenoid, femoral head, as well as uh, the uh, vertebrae they attach, and that is how the shoulder joint moves uh, smoothly, and the articular cartilage acts as a shock absorber, as you know. And when it comes to the glenoid, there is a labrum, which is a fibrocartilage in a structure, which is surrounding the glenoid cavity, which, as I said, will increase the depth of the glenohumeral joint and provides additional stability to an inherently unstable glenohumeral joint. So, coming to the ligaments, there are many ligaments, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the middle glenohumeral ligament, the inferior glenohumeral ligament, clavicular ligament, acromial ligaments. So, all these ligaments provide additional stability and when these ligaments are injured, you develop uh, various uh, instabilities of the shoulder joint. So coming to the shoulder dislocation, <coughs> so as I said, commonest large joint dislocation of the body, which is extremely mobile joint, hence it is inherently unstable. Uh, two very main patterns, one is anterior dislocation, the second is posterior dislocation. So if the humeral head moves to the front of the glenoid, it is anterior dislocation, when it moves to the back, it is a posterior dislocation. So the shape of the bones as well as the uh, strength of the ligaments around the bones and the dynamic uh, muscles around the joint will actually uh, provide the stability for the glenohumeral joint. And the recurrent dislocations happen when there is injury to the labrum or the muscles. So if you look at it, the shoulder joint stability again is dependent on static soft tissues which are ligaments, dynamic soft tissues which are the muscles around the joint, negative suction pressure within the joint and also the bony anatomy. So all these put together will provide the stability to the shoulder joint. So why it becomes unstable, the shoulder joint? It can be due to a macrotraumatic or microtraumatic or atraumatic. Macrotraumatic is all we know, the, the classic shoulder dislocation, someone has a major trauma or a, a football injury, cricket injury, and then they have a dislocation. Air traumatic is where they do not have any history of trauma, but the shoulder continues to dislocate. Micro traumatic is somewhere in between where repeated stretching of the muscles and the ligaments uh, leads to the micro trauma. So it can be divided into two things. One is called tubs, which is traumatic unidirectional uh, injury in which there is a bank cut injury inside and surgery is usually necessary. Whereas AMRI is air traumatic, which is multidirectional and bilateral in many people. And rehabilitation is the mainstay of therapy. And uh, if you look into the, uh, these things can be divided into like three poles. One pole is the traumatic structural, the second pole is atraumatic, but there is some structural problem, but the structural problem may not be amenable to surgical intervention, like ligamentous laxity. If you look at this uh, uh, ballet dancer who is uh, who's dancing in an extreme posture, so there the ligaments are completely stretched, but you cannot simply repair those stretched ligaments to make them uh, stable. And whereas the polar three, which is very important, are the, are the party people, you know, where they can voluntarily dislocate the joints on their, uh, <coughs> on their will. So clinical testing, test for the anterior instability uh, by apprehension test, in supine or arm affected. And also most important is to understand about the beaten score, which is a score that is given by whether the patient is able to touch the floor and any uh, thumb is coming parallel to the forearm, hyper extension of the little finger, hyper extension of the thumb. So if they have high beaten score, that essentially means that their ligaments are inherently lax and uh, surgical interventions may not be very much uh, successful. So after the first episode of dislocation, what should we do? Usually we give them a brace, either in internal rotation, which is a standard arm sling pouch. Some surgeons keep them in external rotation but uh, many studies have shown that there is no significant difference whether you immobilize in internal rotation or external rotation. So usually the immediate immobilization is followed by uh, a range of movement and strengthening exercise over a period of time. The other option is to go for the primary surgical repair. So we'll <coughs> look into this. So as I said, 2 to 8 percent of general population are known to suffer from uh, at least one episode of shoulder dis dislocation in their lifetime, depending on the <coughs> lifestyles of the patient populations and uh, as I said, you know, 
among the two main methods, one is non-operative after first dislocation. There is no doubt if the patient is having recurrent dislocation over a period of time, surgical option would be essential, but after first dislocation, what should we do? So these are the questions that we need to answer. What is the natural history of primary dislocations? What happens if you do not operate, if you go on doing physiotherapy? And uh, what is the effect of surgical intervention on natural history? What are the risks of uh, developing long-term osteoarthritis? And which immobilization technique is better? And what are the outcomes of surgeries and their complications? So, natural history, very important to understand that if someone is under 20 years of age, the risk of dislocation is in the range of 70 to 100 percent. So, the first dislocation happening before 20 years of age, there is a very high chance that they may end up in recurrent dislocation over a period of time. So, for them, it may be beneficial to go for immediate surgery, especially if the patient continues to want, uh, wants to continue to perform uh, <coughs> athletic activities. If they are between 20 and 30 years, the dislocation risk is between 70 and 80 percent. If they are above 40 to 50 years of old, then it is between 14 to 22 percent. So that is very important to understand. So um, many of the papers have been written and uh, the conclusion is that uh, if there is a bank cut lesion, which is a soft tissue lesion within the shoulder following the primary injury, the anatomic repair with orthoscopic technique will certainly decrease the chance of recurrence. So the rate of recurrence is certainly low in those patients who underwent anatomic bank cut repairs. And uh, the evidence is to recommend the primary repair in very young patients who are less than 20 years of age and who continue to be physically active. Again, the osteoarthritis, the risk of osteoarthritis, if you do surgery and if you do not surgery, the odds are in the favor of uh, surgical intervention over a period of time because uh, without surgery, the chance of recurrent dislocation is high and they may end up having uh, secondary osteoarthritis. They said immobilization technique, whether to keep them in external rotation or internal rotation. The, uh, scientifically, if you look at it, if you keep them in external rotation, the anterior capsuloperiosteal sleeve, which is detached at the time of injury, has higher chance of getting reattached again. But statistically, it has been proven that uh, irrespective of the position of immobilization, the recurrence rates remain the same. So surgery, whether well, it will reduce the recurrences again, yeah, stabilization. If you do not do the surgery in early stages, we sometimes see patients who had 10, 15, 20 dislocations and then they come for surgery. So when they come at that stage, what happens is there is a significant uh, problem in, the, in terms of elongation of the capsule and progressive ligamentous injury to the point that there may not be enough ligament to suture back on and also there is significant glenoid bone loss with recurrent dislocations. So early surgery is probably better. And what are the risks of surgical uh, intervention? There is about a 1 to 8 percent chance of nerve injury with open techniques whereas with the modern orthoscopic techniques it is less than 1 percent. Infection risk is about 1 to 5 percent with open, less than 1 percent with orthoscopic. Loss of range of movements, subscapular dysfunction, development of arthritis, they are all common with open surgeries, much less so with the arthroscopic surgery. So essentially this is what we do. The glenoid, uh, we make holes into the glenoid, put some uh, uh, suture anchors and then repair the, uh, these are the actual pictures, that is how it looks, uh, with the two to three anchors on the face of glenoid and uh, uh, replacing the, uh, the bumper effect of the labrum. So these are the recurrent states. Initially, in the 90s, the orthoscopic uh, surgery recurrent states were much higher compared to the open surgery, but if you look at the latest literature from 2006 on the recurrent state is uh, less than 5%, 1 to 5% with orthoscopic surgeries, better than open surgery. So, this is the open surgery, this is how much you need to expose, and this is the length of the wound, and this is the orthoscopic surgery where you see two small, less than one centimeter incisions through which we can complete the procedure. So we'll just quickly go through the animation of uh, how we do orthoscopic uh, bankers repair. So that's a cleaning humeral joint as you know. And uh, this is where the humeral head is and this is the labrum uh, which surrounds the glenoid cavity. And with the, uh, with the recurrent dislocation what happens is the, the glenoid labrum gets torn 
especially between the 3 o'clock position to 6 o'clock position, that is the anterior inferior quadrant of glenoid labrum gets detached uh, in, uh, <coughs> in the dislocation process. So the wide range of movements as we discussed are possible because of the uh, smaller surface area and the ligaments inherently due to stability. So when this happens, the labrum in the anterior inferior quadrant gets torn and between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock that is where it is usually torn and they continue to develop uh, uh, anterior inferior recurrent instability especially in younger patients. So they are prone to repeat dislocations as long as they are young. So as they grow older beyond 40, 50 years of age, the risk of uh, recurrence comes down significantly. So physical examination is essential as we discussed to identify any uh, long-term uh, issues as well as generalized ligament laxity. Plain X-ray MRI will uh, give us uh, ideas as to what we are dealing with. As I suggested, first time dislocation after, uh, after the age of 30, certainly we should try physical therapy and uh, uh, Madam next to me will talk about uh, the rehabilitation aspects of uh, shoulder <coughs> injuries uh, in detail. So when conservative measures fail, we go for surgical intervention in which uh, arthroscopically, these are the, this is the arthroscopic setup where this is the viewing portal through which we put a camera and then uh, usually the patient is under general anesthesia, a special shoulder table is arranged and uh, with the small incisions we send the uh, camera inside and with the arthroscopic camera the visualization is done using the normal saline and the excellent visualization is possible these days you know we have hd and 4k cameras which actually magnify the lesion significantly and uh, excellent visualization with attention to detail can be managed and uh, the procedure per se involves making the area where the labrum is detached a little bit rough making small holes which are about two millimeters into the glenoid and then these are the anchors that are put into the glenoid bone and there are some sutures that come out and those sutures are passed through the glenoid labral tissue and the labral is reattached back and this is how the patient ends up with the one centimeter three one centimeter uh, wounds uh, after the surgery so come in comparison to the open technique the arthroscopic technique has got uh, uh, better advantages in terms of uh, early mobilization so when it comes to this uh, recurrent instability, Bancard's lesion, the anterior inferior labral tear, is the commonest lesion that we see, but there are some other lesions in the shoulder which can also give rise to recurrent instability. So we need to think beyond Bancard's. Why does a uh, Bancard repair fail? It could be because of technical aspects of uh, surgery, or uh, the surgeon might have missed the lesions that could be in addition to Bancard, which is a Hagel lesion, which is human elevation of glenohumeral ligament, hill sacs lesions, and bone Bancard lesions. So hydral lesion is where the uh, glenohumeral ligament rather than getting detached at the glenoid labrum can sometimes get detached on the humeral side. So this has to be uh, identified and if it is there we have to repair it at the humeral side and not at the glenoid side either by open or arthroscopic methods. The heel sac lesion is very important for us to understand. This is a indentation fracture of the posterior aspect of the humeral head. So when the humerus comes to the front of the scapula, the sharp edge of the glenoid makes an indentation at the back of the humeral head. This is the hill sac lesion. So when you replace the, relocate the humeral head back into the position, in the extreme rotation movements what happens as you can see is when, when it tries to externally rotate, the indented part comes in contact with the anterior edge of the glenoid and then the recurrence chances increase. So this has to be adjust with what is called the arthroscopic dental sash procedure which is uh, nothing but uh, similar procedure in in which in addition to the uh, <coughs> glenoid uh, labral repair we also repair the capsule and muscle at the back of the glenoid i'll just show you how it is done so this is the glenoid labrum which we have already seen so the glenoid labrum is freshened the tear is freshened and uh, we make holes into the glenoid labrum and then that is sutured with the suture anchors into the, uh, into the glenoid bone. So this is the labral repair, the bank art repair. This is the anchor that is going in 
the suture that is actually being tightened so that the labellum gets repaired. Now, in addition to this, what we do is, this is the hill sac lesion, as you can see, the indentation defect in the posterior aspect of the human head. And we drill hole into this and a suture anchor is placed. And these sutures are taken through the ligament at the back, ligament and the infraspinatus muscle at the back. And the muscle and uh, the posterior ligaments are tied onto that. And then the patient goes onto the arm place and then uh, usual physiotherapy happens. So the third aspect is, uh, this is what happens in a uh, humeral bone loss. So we discussed about the uh, labral detachment from the glenoid followed by bone defect of the humeral head and this is the bone defect of the glenoid. So as well as having the ligament injury at the front of glenoid with multiple recurrent dislocations, if someone has 10 dislocations, 20 dislocations, it is not uncommon to see these patients. The bone at the anterior aspect of glenoid also progressively gets damaged. So if you look at it, so this is how the 3D CT scan is done and this is, if you see, this part is missing. This is a recreation of what is missing. So if you see, here, in, instead of the glenoid extending from here to this arrow mark, this part is missing. So this can, you know, if you look at it, this glenoid part is missing and this can predispose the humeral head to be dislocated uh, into a recurrence. So with this uh, condition, we do what is called as a modified attached technique. So the latage technique is usually done in an open method, although the orthoscopic method is coming into work recently. So this is how a latage is done. The coracoid is uh, uh, the so this is a latage procedure. Again, there is this uh, labral tear, and again a bony bank cut tear in which the small edge of the glenoid the bony edge of the glenoid is missing from the anterior aspect of the uh, glenoid bone. So for this, what we do is uh, do a, an open surgery, which is a latage procedure, in which uh, uh, recurrent anterior instability associated with the bone loss and uh, the technique is to take out a small piece of... Uh, uh, so only when there is significant injury to the glenoid bone, which, is, which cannot be addressed with just the ligament repair. That is when we do this. So this is an open technique where we make an incision at the front of uh, shoulder joint. And then once this is done, the coracoid is exposed. The coracoid is a bone which is an uh, attachment point for the conjoint tendon, the coracoid brachialis and the shorted of biceps. So the whole of the neurovascular bundle lies just in field grade, so this is a quite a complex surgery and then we <coughs> detach the coracoid from the base and along with this attachment we make a small split in the subscapularis. So two holes are made through the coracoid bone, a small split is made in the subscapularis muscle and through that split the detached bone is introduced and this is fixed to the anterior edge of the glenoid. So where the glenoid is deficient this is fixed with the screws. So this is an open technique, latage technique, very, very uh, extremely effective in, uh, pre in preventing dislocations, especially in high performance athletes uh, who had multiple dislocations. We usually consider these in uh, wrestlers and uh, people who play direct contact sports. So this is a latage procedure. So this is a busy slide, but uh, uh, mainly to understand that, you know, depending on the quantity of bone loss, whether it is a glenoid bone loss, whether it is a humeral head bone loss, so this algorithm has to uh, plan which type of surgery for which patient. So, to just summarize, the capsular labral repair, bank out repair, subscapular procedures, we are not doing these these days, putiplat surgeries and stuff, stuff. Colocat transfer, which I just discussed, the latage procedure, these are essentially the operative methods for uh, traumatic recurrent anterior dislocation in which there is a soft tissue or bony bank or injury. Whereas, uh, as we said, there are there is other extreme of shoulder dislocations where there is no identifiable bank or lesion in which things like capsule application in which the capsule, the size of the capsule is reduced in open surgeries. These can be done as well as uh, patients with uh, uh, congenital changes in the orientation of the glenoid, they can be managed with uh, glenoid reorientation procedures. And this is another 
type, the recurrent posterior dislocation of shoulder, not a common injury. The humeral head gets locked behind the uh, glenoid cavity and uh, this is where there is a reverse hill sac lesion which is in the front of the humeral head in which we do an open induction and then uh, repair the reverse hill sac lesion with the subscapular disc transfer into the reverse hill sac lesion. This is uh, of historical interest. We are not doing the open bank heart repair anymore, but this is how an open bank heart repair is done. So that uh, summarizes the uh, uh, shoulder dislocation. So we'll quickly move on to the other two aspects, which is uh, acromial clavicular joint injuries. These are also very commonly seen. This is how the normal acromial clavicular joint should look like. This is uh, extreme dislocation, which is uh, stage four, in which both the conoid and trapezoid ligaments of the coracoclavicular ligament of thorn, as well as the acromioclavicular ligaments. So for these patients, uh, if it is a mild level, we can treat them non-operatively. If the injury is significant, then we treat either with open procedures like plating or with the orthoscopic procedures using a tight rope between the distal clavicle and the coracoid. Moving on to the rotator cuff tears, uh, we know that they can be traumatic or degenerative. So this is how the humeral uh, uh, rotator cuff tear affects the rotator cuff between the acromion and humeral head. Once it gets torn over the period of years, the patients will develop a rotator cuff uh, arthropathy. So muscle testing, you are all experts in that, just brushing through how to test for uh, different muscles and how to check for impeachment signs, including Hawkins sign. Drop on test, which is very, very important to understand. Sometimes patients passively are able to fully abduct, but when you ask them to bring it down, suddenly it will drop at one point. That is because of the complete tail of uh, the uh, rotator cuff. So this is how uh, we have the algorithm for rotator cuff tears, depending on the size and whether it is a bursal surface tear or an articular surface tear, whether it is a complete tear, whether it is a massive tear, we devise many different methods. So coming to the operative method of uh, uh, rotator cuff tear, we'll just quickly go through this uh, animation video. Probably another five ten minutes this uh, presentation should be done. So these are the rotator cuff tendons, as you see. This is the supraspinatus, the commonest tendon that is torn. About 80 to 90 percent of all rotator cuff tears happen in, in supraspinatus. This is the subscapularis in the front, infraspinatus, anterior spinal at the back. Uh, any of these uh, uh, muscles can be torn, but the commonest is supraspinatus. It can be either a partial tear in which we do a partial repair, and it can be a complete tear in which we uh, re, re uh, apply it back onto the bone where it has come from. Usually, in elderly patients, there is a associated uh, acromion hypertrophy or the hooked acromion, as we call it, which is what actually causes the, uh, which is a cause of acute on chronic rotator cuff tears. So in those patients, it can occur at any age, in younger patients to older patients. Usually we go for uh, surgical intervention when the non-surgical treatments, including uh, non-operative methods and uh, physiotherapy fails after six months to one year. Especially in uh, partial tests, we... Sorry. through the video in this because you can't actually so in rajita of tear as I said so again compared to open surgery the uh, arthroscopic surgery is uh, much easier in terms of for patient's recovery. So this is how we see inside, again, three portal techniques. We essentially, for the partial tear of the tendon, we just repair it then and there. But if it is a complete tear, uh, so this is how we do the acromioplasty. The excess bone is removed using the bone shavers. Similar to what they do, the spinal surgeons do in spine surgery where they remove the excess uh, osteophytic bone from this. So this is a complete area of supraspinatus. So the torn fibers are the excised and then the, this is the greater tuberosity of uh, humerus where we put uh, suture anchors inside and then those anchors have got sutures which are used to tie down the, uh, the tendon back into the position. So 
in advanced case of rotator cuff tail, if they are not treated in time, what can happen? scars also heal very nicely. So that's a surgical scar in the front for the liver shoulder arthroplasty. So this is uh, in a sense the, the surgical management of uh, shoulder injuries. So I put only one conclusion which is uh, teamwork because uh, as you know especially any of these uh, joint injuries mainly the sh uh, knee as well as more important than the knee is the shoulder the physiotherapist involvement along with the surgeon is uh, quintessential in uh, providing optimal outcomes to the patient, especially in cases of rotator cuff repair as well as uh, pancreas repair and uh, shoulder arthroplasties. The uh, invaluable uh, contribution from the physiotherapist and the close working relationship between the surgeon and physiotherapist is essential and that is one of the reasons why we wanted to start having these uh, discussions, interactions between the surgeons and physiotherapists. And this is uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Pravin and Dr. Shashi. We work as a team and they cater to various needs. So the teamwork within the department and with the rest of the departments is important. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you, Vedipri Kassar, for your valuable time and a knowledgeable session. So, uh, if there is any queries, you can ask it, sir, because he is here right now. Anyone from the audience? Sir. So there is one query. Yeah. Hi, sir. This is Chavan. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in India, the surgery is like uh, what is the prognosis of the patient? Is the diabetes or any of the hypertension and the complications. So what is the model of the prognosis? Any of the ages? Um, patients with uh, diabetes especially are prone for infections. The infection risk is about two to three times more than someone without diabetes. <coughs> Hence uh, diabetic patients have to be optimized before surgery. And uh, especially in elective and semi-elective surgeries, the long-term uh, control of diabetes uh, with uh, monitoring of HPA1C is very, very important. And uh, that is for the infection. As well as uh, diabetic patients are more prone to develop frozen shoulder, as you know. And this is another aspect that we need to consider. And uh, the third aspect is uh, uh, patients with cardiovascular comorbidities, they need to be thoroughly evaluated because some of these surgeries, especially like liver shoulder replacement or uh, major surgeries with uh, blood loss, so we need to optimize these patients before surgery. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we will proceed with the second uh, guest for today. She is Dr. Sujata Maharati, the faculty at Nirtar. Uh, she is presently pursuing her PhD at NIMS and she has also worked as principal at VAPMS College of Physiotherapy, Vishakapatnam. Ma'am, we will proceed with her. Good morning, everybody. So, uh, Dr. Veda Prakas, uh, sir, he has uh, nicely dealt with uh, shoulder anatomy and uh, uh, surgical aspect of shoulder injuries. So, I will get you with uh, the rehabilitation of operative and non-operative shoulder instabilities. So, as uh, sir has already discussed the anatomy, so it has become easy for me to uh, deal with the biomechanics aspect. So the biomechanics, uh, relevant biomechanics for shoulder injury, uh, all of us uh, as physiotherapists, we know the scapular pain. So scapular pain is the uh, uh, pain in which the scapula lies. And it is exactly in between the uh, sagittal and frontal plane midway, uh, somewhere between 30 to 45 degree from the frontal plane towards the sagittal plane. And uh, what are the importance of scapular plane? Uh, that uh, if the scapular plane, the glenohumeral joint in the scapular plane optimizes the osseous congruity between the humeral head and the glenoid. That means that is the optimal position between the glenoid and the humeral head. And uh, this is also widely recommended as the optimal position for various evaluation techniques and rehabilitation exercises. 
So the significance of scapular pain or the pain already uh, I have discussed that uh, there is uh, optimal congruence or optimal uh, placement. There is no bony impingement of the greater tuberosity against the acromion process. If we do exercise in this pain, scapular pain, then uh, the bony impingement doesn't occur. There is less stress on the anterior capsular components of the glenohumeral joint. And also it en enhances the rotator cuff through the length tension relationship maintenance so that uh, the muscle develops optimal efficiency and optimal tension. As we know, uh, the shoulder elevation depends upon the deltoid and the rotator cuff force coupling. Sir has already discussed regarding this. So the deltoid and the rotator cuff muscle, they act as a force couple. So force couple is a phenomena where two opposing muscular forces, they work together to enable a motion to occur. So they work as either synergist or agonist. So in this uh, situation, the deltoid act as the prime mover or the agonist and uh, the rotator cuff muscle, they work as a synergist. So they together form a force couple and help in the elevation movement. Rotator cuff maintains humoral congruency by providing inferiorly directed or compressive force during arm elevation by the deltoid. So it compresses the joint and the uh, rotator cuff muscle holds the humeral head pulled towards the glenoid cavity throughout the elevation so that superior dislocation doesn't occur. As Sir has uh, shown how the rotator cuff injury produces a superior dislocation of the glenohumeral joint. So rotator cuff uh, 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 muscle is called the dynamic stabilizer and it provides the humeral conveyance. This also uh, minimizes the superior translation already discussed. Inappropriate and unbalanced strain training can lead to imbalances in the deltoid rotator cuff force cover. So if there is uh, more strengthening of either the deltoid muscle and less strengthening of rotator cuff muscle, then also this imbalance can lead to this uh, rotator cuff force cover imbalance. Glenohumeral resting position or loose back position. So as physios, we know the loose back position and the close back position. So the loose back position is uh, in uh, glenohumeral joint is 55 to 70 degrees of abduction in the scapular plane. And this is the position where there is maximum range of motion and laxity. And there is minimal tension or stress in the supportive structure surrounding the joint. Scapulohumeral rhythm. Scapulohumeral rhythm, also it is called glenohumeral rhythm, and it was first published by Cordman in 1930. And it is a kinematic interaction between the scapula and the humerus. When there is a change in the normal position of the scapula in relation to the humerus, this can cause a dysfunction of the scapulohumeral rhythm and this is called scapular dyskinesia. So scapulohumeral rhythm uh, occurs in a ratio of 1 is to 2 when the arm is abducted 180 degree, 60 degree occurs by rotation of the scapula and 120 degree motion is contributed by the humerus, glenohumeral joint and 60 degree is contributed by the scapular rotation. What is the purpose of scapulohumeral rhythm? This preserves the length tension relationship of the glenohumeral muscles. So when there is a upward rotation of the scapula, the muscles they sustain optimal force post production through a larger range of motion. That means because there is a proportionate rotation of scapula along with the humerus, the uh, optimal relationship, length tension relationship of the rotator cuff muscle is maintained and also the scapulothoracic muscles so they can uh, create optimal tension. So that is the most important aspect of scapulohumeral rhythm. 
and it prevents impingement between the humerus and the abdomen. Simultaneous movement of the humerus and scapula during shoulder elevation limits relative movement between the two bones. So the two bones they are not uh, compressed against each other due to this scapulohumeral rhythm. So there are two uh, advantages or purposes of scapulohumeral rhythm. Force coupled during arm elevation. So normal arm elevation accompanies three dimensional scapular kinematic pattern. That is upward rotation and posterior tilting and varying degrees of internal and external rotation. So upward rotation of the scapula that Upward rotation of the uh, scapula, already we know that uh, it occurs in the uh, coronal or frontal plane and uh, there is posterior tilting and also the internal and external rotation. Internal and external rotation of the scapula. So these three uh, motions of the scapula are accompanied movements in the upward elevation. And also there is a, a translational movement of the scapula that is protraction and retraction and elevation and depression. The serratus anterior and trapezius force couple which are the primary muscular stabilization and prime mover of upward rotation of scapula during arm elevation. So serratus anterior and trapezius they form the primary force couple during arm elevation and uh, usually 0 to 80 degree of arm elevation, they help as the stabilizing mass, uh, force. And the lower trapezius and the serratus anterior function as the primary scapular stabilizer in phase 2 and 3, that means between 80 to 140 degrees of elevation. So due to uh, the lateral shift of the scapulothoracic instantaneous center of rotation, so because there is a shift of the instantaneous uh, center of rotation during arm elevation, so the lower trapezius and serratus anterior act as the main force couple during the phase 2 and 3. Scapular dyskinesia, change of the normal position of the scapula in relation to the humerus. So scapular dyskinesia, there is a change in the normal position of the scapula and uh, this can cause a dysfunction or disruption of the normal linohumeral rhythm mechanism. It has been reported that scapular dyskinesis occurs in 68 to 100% 100 of patients with shoulder injuries. So almost uh, major uh, shoulder injuries, they have this scapular dyskinesis including glenohumeral instability, rotator cuff abnormality, and labyrinth tears. So causes of scapular dyskinesia, uh, joint causes, high grade and uh, acromioclavicular instability, uh, acromioclavicular atrosis and instability and glenohumeral joint internal derangement, urological causes, cervical radiculopathy, long thoracic or spinal, accessory nerve palsy, and bony causes, thoracic kyphosis or clavicular fracture and inflexibility causes which is more important for physiotherapist that is inflexibility and stiffness of the pectoral is minor and biceps short held because they are attached to the coracoid process they can cause a create a anterior tilt and protraction due to their pull on the coracoid. So soft tissue posterior shoulder inflexibility also can lead to glenohumeral internal rotation deficit, which can cause scapular dyskinesis. Muscular causes, serratus anterior activation and strength is decreased in patients with impingement. There are two types of impingement already Sar has uh, discussed, primary impingement and secondary impingement. So primary impingement occurs where there is uh, uh, the rotator cuff, uh, the scapular uh, stabilizer and rotator cuff injuries and uh, secondary impingement occurs where there is internal derangement. So due to internal derangement, there is more burden on the uh, muscular structures and uh, as a result, the muscles become overburdened and overactive 
and cause a chronic injury and uh, that is that causes secondary impingement so in uh, primary impingement um, serratus anterior activation so both types of impingement there is uh, serratus anterior activation and strength is decreased so almost all the stabilizers as uh, serratus anterior trapezius uh, then your latissimus dorsi and rhombus teres major their strength is decreased in cases of impingement the upper trapezius and lower trapezius post couple may be altered we delayed onset of activation in the lower trapezius which alters scapular upward rotation and posterior tilt so due to the lack of upward rotation and posterior tilt the uh, upper um, this uh, scapular dystenesis can occur alter scapular motion or position both decrease the linear distance of the subacromial space so the subacromial space also decreases due to the anterior tilt and also due to lack of upward rotation of the scapula this also decreases the rotator cuff strength and uh, increase strain on the anterior retinohumeral ligament so this causes secondary impingement symptoms scapular dysfunction pattern this has been de uh, des described by kipler and he has identified three specific scapular dysfunction patterns these scapular uh, dysfunctions are on inferior or type 1 medial or type 2 and superior or type 3 in this classification system the inferior angle usually normally the inferior angle translates away from the midline with normal symmetrical scapular motion and the scapular medial border that is that remains uh, attached against the thoracic wall so that it uh, doesn't become prominent so that is a normal motion but in case of dysfunctions they become prominent so that is type 1 inferior dysfunction so the visual feature in type 1 inferior dysfunction is the prominence of the inferior angle as a result of anterior tilting of the scapula so the scapula becomes anteriorly tilted and the inferior angle becomes prominent in the sagittal plane inferior pattern presentation is better visualized while in the hands on hip position so this position when the hands are on the waist uh, uh, and also during eccentric lowering of the overhead from the overhead elevation this a uh, visual feature becomes more prominent and this uh, is more common with rotator cuff dysfunction type 2 medial dysfunction uh, this is primary um, uh, problem with uh, shoulder joint instability glenohumeral instability the primary visual feature is the prominence of entire medial scapular border border due to internal rotation of the scapula in the transverse plane so as with type 1 the type 2 presentation becomes more evident also in the hands on hip position and also during active eccentric flowing from the overhead type 3 is characterized by excessive and early elevation of the scapula during upper extremity elevation so during the elevation uh, the there is excessive and early elevation of scapula means the glenohumeral rhythm is altered so this uh, pattern has been referred to as compensatory shoulder hiking or shrug and is most often seen in patients with rotator cuff dysfunction and also deltoid rotator cuff force imbalances so this uh, all are also combined can be present combined scapular dystenesis test so these are some diagnostic procedures to confirm the scapular dystenesis and also these can be utilized during the rehabilitation procedure to assess the prognosis and assess the improvement this test also can be utilized so this is a lateral scapular slide test this is a semi dynamic test major scapular position and scapular stabilization strength on both injured and non injured sides so measurements are taken from a fixed point on the scapula like superior angle 
then the inferior angle and uh, uh, the spine of the scapula. And they are taking from a fixed point of the spine, like the spine, uh, spine of the scapula that corresponds to the T2, T3. And the inferior angle corresponds to T6 to T7 or T8. And uh, the superior angle of the scapula that corresponds to T2. So from those fixed points, these measurements are taken. And uh, they are taken in three positions, different positions, like sitting or standing with arms resting on the side, hands on the hip, that is uh, thumbs posterior 45 degree abduction position, this position, and 90 degree abduction and uh, full internal rotation position. So in three positions, the scapular measurements uh, are taken both injured and non-injured sides, and uh, they are compared. And if the difference varies between 1 to 1.5 centimeter, then it is uh, okay, normal. Uh, if it be, uh, becomes more than 1.5 centimeter, then it is significant. Scapular retraction test, these are also some tests which also can be utilized as a therapeutic procedure and at the same time it also can be uh, utilized to assess the um, like, uh, presence of the dysthymesis. So this baseline uh, range of motion and pain is evaluated. Then this test is positive if pain is reduced as the therapist assists active elevation by applying a posterior tilt and external rotation motion to the scapula. So the therapist applies a external rotation motion, so internal rotation and external rotation. So the therapist stabilizes the scapula applying the external rotation motion and posterior tilt. So uh, if uh, pain is reduced during the motion, then this test is positive. Scapular assistance test, uh, baseline range of motion and pain is evaluated. Then uh, the therapist applies an assist to the scapular dynamics. This test is positive if range of motion is increased. If by giving assistance, the range of motion is increased, then uh, it confirms the scapula dysthymesis. So that there is some uh, deficiency or inefficiency on the part of the scapular stabilization muscles. Scapular cliff sign. Uh, this is observed in patients with spinal accessory nerve lesions. And uh, the test maneuver is uh, external rotation manual muscle test uh, is applied with the shoulder at the side of the body. And uh, the positive flip sign is provocation of the medial and inferior border of the scapula away from the thorax under the load of the manual muscle test force of external rotation. So the therapist gives a uh, external rotation um, motion to the patient and observes the uh, motion of the medial and inferior border of the scapula. So this again confirms the inefficiency of the scapular stabilization muscle to adequately control during the rotation load. Wall push-up test. Patient performs wall push-ups for 15 to 20 times and uh, weakness of scapular muscle uh, bringing usually shows off with 5 to 10 push-ups. So this uh, is a test which is uh, used to uh, elicit the fatigueness uh, or the weakness of the scapular stabilization muscles. So they become unduly uh, fatigued. Uh, for stronger and younger population, perform the test on the floor. So wall push-up test is also usually we do uh, as a therapeutic uh, exercise. We uh, utilize this for serratus anterior. So this uh, can be utilized also as a diagnostic test. Management and interventions. Uh, the aims are reducing the posterior capsule and pectoralis spinal restriction, restoring peristapular muscle balance through exercises and promoting early and increased serratus anterior lower and middle trapezius activation while minimizing upper trapezius activity. Phase 1 soft tissue release. So uh, there are three phases in this and phase one soft tissue release. So mainly uh, the pectoral muscle, pectoral is minor and the posterior rotator cuff muscle and posterior capsule release should be done 
thoracic spine mobility, uh, manual mobilization and manipulation techniques also can be applied. Thoracic spine extension exercises also can be added. Pectoral stretch, sleeper stretch, sleeper stretch is a position, uh, the sideline position, um, and uh, uh, affected shoulders should be up. And uh, the patient applies the internal rotation uh, st uh, movement stretch to for, means internally stretch the um, shoulder glenohumeral joint while while uh, tightly um, squeezes the scapula so that the scapula stabilizes so they stabilize the scapu scapula and uh, at the same time there is an internal rotation so sleeper stretch and upper trapezius stretch upper trapezius stretch can be done in the uh, corner of the house and uh, that stretches the upper trapezius, uh, sorry, uh, the pectoralis. And uh, the upper trapezius can be stretched in a sitting position nicely by keeping the hand uh, in the back and uh, moving the head to the opposite side um, and also rotation to the same side. So this uh, already we know. Then uh, the isometrics and isotonics uh, exercises, uh, which uh, should be dealt with. Scapular pinches. Scapular pinch is the scapular retraction exercise. Uh, like uh, a patient can do in neutral position also, like moving both the uh, extremity back. So there is scapular retraction. Robbery pinches. Robbery pinches can be done in this position. Uh, and moving the scapula backward. So this is again retraction, low row wall isometrics. So the uh, subject can stand against the wall and uh, keeping it in neutral position and press it back so that there is a strong contraction of the stabilizer muscles. Similarly, shoulder external rotation isometrics against the uh, wall also uh, can be done or can be done uh, against any fixed uh, point. Scapular depression isometrics can be done uh, against the floor, scapular depression. On the floor, you can keep your hand on the floor and press it down. Scapular pinches with TheraBand. exercises.
this is again the serratus anterior active issue along with the rotator cuff muscle. So this type of exercises can be done very easily with therapy. exercises are usually done in a gym because these are registered exercises. So in a uh, multi-gym, these exercises can be done against a uh, amount of resistance. So seated rows and high rows, seated rows means against the, against a resistance in the backward direction and high rows in this position, this motion and prone rows in prone position the uh, backward movement like the horizontal abduction position standing already with theraband I already have shown prone Y, P and W so in prone position you can do the exercise in 120 degree abduction and in horizontal abduction and also in slightly internal rotation position so this will activate almost all the scapular stabilizer muscles Sideline external rotation position is uh, important because usually in standing position or su supine po uh, seated position, if you do the external rotation with any uh, dumbbell or weight, then that actively uh, mainly activates the biceps because uh, this is acting against the gravity. So the weight is acting downward. So uh, the external rotation activation becomes inefficient. That's why sideline external rotation is uh, uh, recommended. Already Sar has dealt with uh, the instability causes, so I will uh, very briefly go through that. Causes of instability is defined as a pathologic increase in the glenohumeral translation, which results in symptoms due to disruption of the integrity of the stabilizing structures, which includes the spectrum of disorders. Uh, this is two types already. Has discussed traumatic and atraumatic. Directions of instability can be anterior, posterior, multiple, and traumatic already discussed, so I am not going in detail. Factors maintaining static stability. So, static stabilizers are the capsular ligamentous structures, uh, which are the ligaments and the capsules and the labrum, and also the uh, bony version of the glenohumeral uh, joint, which is very important for static stability and uh, the negative intraarticular pressure that is also important. So the dynamic stabilizers are the muscles, muscular tendinous structures. So the rotator cuff, uh, cuff group of muscles are the primary stabilizers and the long head of the biceps along with the long head of the biceps, these are the primary stabilizers. And scapulothoracic stabilizers are the secondary stabilizers. And uh, also the proprioceptive mechanism that also plays a very important role in dynamic stabilization. When the static stabilizers are disrupted, like the capsular ligamentous structure, they actually uh, carry the proprioceptive. So the proprioceptive uh, mechanism is disrupted because the information doesn't go, go to brain and as a result there is a, a decreased neuromuscular contraction, reflex contraction which should occur during the movement. So that pre, uh, leads to uh, reduction in the dynamic stabilization effect. So the, when there is static stabilizer disruption that also alters the dynamic mechanism. So these are the dynamic uh, um, so scapular stabilizer muscles. Chronic recurrent instability, uh, which is, we can say it is uh, both a traumatic or traumatic in between because there is a uh, repeated trauma, micro trauma, not major macro trauma, but we, uh, micro trauma is patient. So there is <coughs> Repetitive extreme external rotation 
with the humerus subduction and extension. So this position, repeated motion of this position during pitching action is uh, usually the culprit which causes this type of uh, instability. So that produ produces gradual weakening of the anterior. So Sarah has already showed how the uh, lesions occur, Hillsack's lesion and Vankar's lesion. So this motion actually produces an anterior translation of the humeral head and that causes the, uh, so this, this type of microtrauma slowly produces the uh, lesions. Produces gradual weakening of the anterior and inferior static restraints and uh, so commonly associated with usually sports. Sports participation, softball, baseball, swimming and weight training and tennis. So all throw, act, throwing action is associated with this type of instability. So features of instability already sir has discussed. So there is laxity of joint capsule and uh, Hillsack's region, Rampart's region or <coughs> Possible signs and symptoms of recurrent instability, there will be pain, there will be clicking sign, complaint of dead arm while throwing and possible subacromial or internal impingement signs. So there will be impingement signs which is uh, Neves and uh, Hopkins Kennedy test will be positive. So usually internal rotation and elevation, this causes the uh, impingement. So this will be positive. So almost uh, all we know that. So if there is an internal rotation of the glenohumeral joint while lifting, then that will cause impingement. So that will cause impingement and if there is an impingement then that will be painful. So possible subacromial or internal impingement signs uh, will be there and uh, the patient may have a positive apprehension taste. Apprehension taste usually occurs in external location, 90 degree uh, abduction and external location position. So that uh, apprehension, patient will have a apprehension of uh, dislocation. And uh, relocation taste also may be positive. Uh, Inter joint accessory motion, particularly in the anterior direction. Features of posterior instability. This is uh, posterior instability, uh, which is a usually uh, uncommon, uh, not very common, uh, usually occurs with seizures. Possible subacromial or internal impingement may be there. Glenohumeral internal rotation deficit is there, uh, which is called GIT pain, clicking and increased joint accessory motion particularly in the posterior direction. So laxity test will show the instability uh, is in which direction. Multidirectional instability, there will be global pain and uh, there will be not uh, any focal point where the patient shows, uh, says that I am having pain in this region. So there will be global shoulder pain and may have a positive sulcus sign. So this positive sulcus sign uh, increases the distance between the acromion process and the glenoid head. So it is visible. Apprehension, relocation phase, anterior release phase will be positive. And the secondary rotator cuff impingement with microtraumatic events uh, during participation occurs. So increased joint accessory motion in multiple planes. Physical examination for instability. Posture uh, can be observed if there is any asymmetry and scapular winging, atrophy and range of motion measurements, active and passive range. Usually instability is associated with more external rotation and less internal rotation. So that should be noted. And uh, there should be consistency in one uh, position while measuring. Uh, then it will give a positive measure. Uh, and also um, other tests in the assessment, uh, they are resistive tests which shows the muscle involvement and also if there is pain, then uh, pain, in the muscle, pain in the muscle will show the uh, positive signs, the resistive test and functional test uh, to the buttock, to the head and also to the opposite scapula can be done. Muscle length testing for the pectoralis minor Platysmos dorsi, pectoralis major, upper trapezius can be done, uh, which are uh, usually affected. Joint accessory motion testing uh, can be done, uh, like it assesses the translation in different degrees of abduction, uh, 
30 degree of abduction, 45 degree of abduction, and again, um, 90 degree of abduction. So because different uh, uh, glenohumeral ligament, they uh, maintains the stability. So it should be tested in different degrees. And proprioception, which is very important, uh, sulcus shine, special provocative and laxity examinations. Special test for instability, uh, load and shift test, apprehension test, anterior release, subluxation relocation test, and laxity test in different degrees of abduction. Impingement test, that is knee sign positive, this is knee sign. And Hawkins Kennedy test in the scapular plane, this is the position for Hawkins Kennedy test. And this sh there should be a internal location, this will cause pain. For a impingement test is done from this position, you bring towards adduction, then it will cause pain. Cross arm adduction, this will cause pain if you uh, touch the opposite shoulder, and uh, uh, then it will cause pain uh, during impingement. So all these tests involve passing movement of the glenohumeral joint and provide an objective evidence of the degree of encroachment and completion of the rotator cuff tendons against the coracoectomial arch. This also give insight into the exercise protocol. So while forming the exercise protocol, you should uh, avoid those positions because the impingement positions uh, can uh, provoke the symptoms and can also irritate the structures. So those positions should be avoided. Non-operative rehabilitation of rotator cuff injury. So rotator cuff injury um, goals uh, decrease in pain to allow for initiation of submaximal rotator cuff and scapular exercise. So first aim is to reduce the pain uh, so that we can start submaximal uh, rotator cuff and scapular stabilizer exercises. Because some maximal exercise increases the blood circulation and also allows for healing. Normalization of capsular relationship through the use of specific mobilization and stretching techniques. So if there is uh, any uh, structures which are preventing the motion, like the posterior capsular structures and anterior tilting due to pectoral spinal tightness, then those structures should be uh, prevented like uh, through stretching and uh, the normalization of the mechani uh, capsular mechanism, the scapular uh, mechanism, kinematic relationship should be restored. Treatment guidelines, modification of sport specific and activities like ergonomic modification should be done. If there is any rotator cuff injury, then ergonomic modification is, a, uh, is essential, uh, like uh, the motions which usually provoke the symptoms should not be done. And if he is a sports person or uh, according to his own profession and job, the activities should be modified. Use of electrotherapeutic modalities to reduce pain and increase blood circulation. So this uh, electrotherapeutic modality, they reduce pain and also increase the circulation, so help in healing. So those can be utilized. Use of scapular stabilizer exercises. Uh, promoting serratus anterior and lower practices post -operative. Use of uh, this rotator cuff uh, exercise, submaximal rotator cuff exercise. So range of motion and mobilization technique can be initiated in case of primary impingement. Only in case of primary impingement, the mobilization techniques should be uh, undertaken because if there is a secondary impingement, then uh, if uh, mobilization techniques are given, then that will um, that will aggravate the symptoms because already there is internal derangement and the capsular ligamentous structures are already disrupted. So if you give mobili mobilization techniques, then that will be aggravated. So not uh, in secondary impingement, but only in primary impingement, these techniques can be given. Rehab protocol of non-operative shoulder instability. So H1, uh, this non-operative non and operative almost uh, equal depending upon the surgeon's uh, preference and the uh, muscle uh, uh, like involvement uh, during the surgery. Some modifications can be done, but uh, the protocol is almost same. So phase one, which uh, lasts for zero to two weeks, um, uh, the main aim is to control pain and edema by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and uh, eyes, ultrasound, pains, interferential therapy. So this type of modality can be given to control pain. Then active assisted range of motion 
in Shupai. So provocative movements should be avoided like abduction and external location uh, at the same time up to uh, 45 degrees. So that should not be given uh, in a page one. Elbow range of motion should be uh, full and arch tolerated. Sling immobilization in neutral or external location position can be given. Scapula stabilizer strengthening exercise begins for 30 years or older. So as sir told, um, young people, young uh, subjects are more uh, vulnerable for uh, dislocation. So for them the immobilization period is uh, more uh, like uh, 3 to 4 weeks and for uh, older patients the immobilization is less. So it can last for uh, 1 week or 4 to 5 days. Phase 2 that last uh, 3 to 4 weeks starts from 3 to 4 weeks. Criteria for progression to four, phase 2 uh, there is reduction in the pain and tenderness and there is, uh, there is adequate immobilization already given. So the goal is 90 degree of forward flexion, 90 degree of abduction and 30 degree of external rotation with arm at the side. So both the movements abduction and external rotation simultaneously should be avoided. But he should be able to achieve 90 degree of elevation, uh, flexion and 90 degree of abduction uh, and 30 degree of external rotation. Uh, then restrictions avoid provocative positions, simultaneous positions. Strengthening protocol for phase 2, begin PNF exercises. PNF exercises like hold relax, contract relax, Rhythmic stabilization. Rhythmic stabilization is a very good exercise and it can, uh, can be given in all the ranges uh, like uh, the available flexion and external rotation range so that uh, almost all we know rhythmic stabilization can be given. Alternate contraction of the opposite agonist and antagonist which gives stability uh, to the joint. So that can be given um, in available range. Scapular stabilization exercise in anti-gravity position or mild resistance. So now we can start the scapular stabilization exercise in the anti-gravity positions um, like in a prone position uh, with a long lever or short lever as the patient tolerates. Then initial rotator cuff strengthening in neutral position. Rotator cuff strengthening is started in phase 2 and uh, it is started in the neutral position not in abduction position. So in the neutral position only, so arms by uh, the side, you can start the external rotation position, external rotation and internal rotation. Low chain isometrics with shoulder in neutral and elbow flex to 90 degree. So closed chain and open chain exercises uh, that uh, almost all of us we know. So closed chain exercises are that when the distal aspect of the motion kinematic chain is fixed. So when the hand is on the ground and we do the exercises that is called closed chain and uh, the, when the distal aspect of the kinematic chain is open that means the hand is uh, moving in a space that is called open chain. So closed chain isometrics are important because they reduce the translation, the anterior and posterior translation. That's why in instability closed chain isometrics are preferred uh, in um, comparison to the uh, open chain motions. So closed chain isometrics with shoulder in neutral and an elbow flex to 90 degrees. So in this position you can give the closed chain uh, isometrics. So depressures and scapular stabilizers and, uh, and this uh, uh, rotator cuff strengthening all can be done in the neutral position. Phase 3 that lasts from weeks 4 to 8 weeks and criteria for progression to phase 3 uh, the, then the, by this time the patient uh, has achieved 140 degree of forward flexion and 40 degree of external rotation with the arm at the side. There is minimal pain or tenderness with strengthening exercises and improvement in strength of rotator cuff and stabilizer muscle. So substantial improvement in the strength of rotator cuff and scapular stabilizer and there is um, just minimal pain then the patient can progress to phase 3. So this should be the criteria. The goals uh, to gain 160 degree of forward flexion 
and fertility of external rotation with the arm in 30 to 45 degree of abduction. So now we can combine together the uh, abduction and external rotation in phase 3 but not 90 degree, only 40 degrees of external rotation with 45 degree of abduction. So in this position we can start the uh, exercises and uh, we should achieve this motion. Exercises in phase 3 continue the PNF exercises and over the shoulder range of motion exercise and progress to isometrics at 45 degrees of abduction and initiation of TheraBand exercise. So, TheraBand exercises can be initiated in this page and uh, the isometrics should be started in 45 degrees of abduction in this page. Progression to the next band, so there are color codes uh, in the TheraBand. Uh, and different colors, they uh, represent uh, different type of resistance. So the progression to the next color code um, can be done only after two to three weeks of uh, with one color code when the patient improves. So there is only one uh, pound uh, difference of resistance between different uh, one color code to the next color code. So this type of uh, TheraBand exercises are very good and uh, they should be given because they are, uh, the patient can exercise independently and uh, whenever he wants he can do the exercises. And there is uh, no chance of uh, translation also, so this is very uh, useful exercise. Open chain exercises are started in this page and progress to light isotonic dumbbell exercise. So dumbbells, light dumbbells, one to three pounds can be given in this page and uh, so open chain and uh, resistive double exercises can be started in this page but ensure that it should be done in the plane of the scapula for the purposes already in answer. Page 4 lasts from week 8 to 4, uh, 12 weeks and uh, criteria for progression to phase 4 is there must be pain free motion of 160 degree of forward flexion and 40 degrees of external rotation with the arm in 30 to 45 degree of abduction. So combined external rotation and abduction is started in this phase. Exercise, uh, all the exercises they are continued and uh, upper extremity endurance training is also incorporated in this phase. Phase 5 last from 12 to 16 weeks and uh, the criteria is pain-free range of motion, no evidence of recurrent instability, and recovery of 70% to 80% of shoulder strength has been uh, restored. So satisfactory physical examination, uh, all the test will show negative results, then we can progress to phase five. So goals, gradual return to functional and sporting, and home exercise program performed three weeks, three times per week for stretching and strengthening. So usually uh, you know, phase five, home exercise program is given and the patient is asked to do the exercises at home. And functional and sport specific strengthening are also introduced in this phase. And biometric exercises which includes the stretch shortening cycle and they're very, uh, very much helpful and essential for the sports persons for uh, improving their agility and the speed and controlling the acceleration and deceleration page of the pitching. So parametric exercise can be started in this page and progress dynamic stability to the end range. Warming signs, persistent instability, if there is any persistent instability, loss of motion, lack of strength, progression and continued pain, then that causes, gives a warning sign. Treatment of complication. So this type of patient may need to move back to the earlier routines. May require increased utilization of pain control modality as earlier. May require surgical intervention. So those who fail to improve with the uh, conservative management, they should be uh, referred to physician surgeon for surgical intervention. Recurrent instability. Uh, is defined by three or more instability events within a year or instability that occurs at rest or during sleep. So that is a strong indication for such a <coughs> So 
So operative management depends upon surgical procedures, surgeon's protocol, mechanism of injury, concomitant injury, and tissue quality, and impaired smoke evaluation. Rehab of operative shoulder uh, instability is almost same, but if there is a internal rotation, uh, like uh, uh, subscapular insertion is involved, then the internal rotation strengthening before four to six weeks is not started for the open stabilization group. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for such a comprehensive session. So, any queries, we are all in. If people here have any doubts, can please raise your hand and we can have a talk. Okay, so now we'll quickly move on to the next session. So, now we have few guests here whom I would like to introduce the people to. First of all, uh, I would like to speak few sentences. Stars shine at night, some stars shine at bright daylight. It's my pleasure to welcome one such star, Dr. Pavan Gorkanti, sir, Director, Yashoda Hospitals. Thank you for taking the invitation, sir. And second, Mr. Karthi Hevel and Ganeshan, the unit head for business operations. So we kindly welcome you. And last but not least, uh, a youngster here in his 20s, the weightlifter, uh, Mr. Karthik. Please come on the grass. So this young man, uh, he is Mr. Hel Helavat Karthik, who has won many district and state weightlifting championships uh, in under 17, in 89 ages range, in 2018, he has won the gold medal in first Kelo India school games held at New Delhi. We welcome you all. We would like to also call Dr. Veda Prakash sir, Dr. Ravi Sumanredi sir, and Dr. Sujata ma'am onto the dais. And then, sir, we would like to hear a few words from you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I don't know about the stars part, though. So maybe, is this what you're referring to, Arjun Reddy or something? Yeah. <laughs> I was in uh, Manipal, I think, uh, like after Uspani, I was in uh, Manipal doing uh, MD general medicine at that time, uh, physiotherapy was a real star, so yeah. So most of you are uh, doing a great job. So, yeah, Arjun Reddy, after I came back from US uh, 2018, first time when I came, uh, yeah, that was a movie, I think, so some old uh, recollections there. But uh, physiotherapy is great, uh, active department, so welcome you all. So great, uh, this was a Sunday morning. And during COVID time, it's, uh, Great to see all of you though. So this is a real active department and uh, another special thing is uh, this auditorium was opened just recently. It has a, a nice view of all the city and all if you open the curtains. Uh, but the first conference is being done by you and for you. So that's great though. Thanks. <laughs> special thanks for all the dignitaries, organizations, uh, organizers like, uh, I don't know, Rajesh, you sleep at
many days to travel. Fortunately, we had her here and we could talk to her and invite her. So, pleasure having you, madam. Getting, uh, getting the director on Sunday to inaugurate a program is a uh, little tough. They, uh, I, I don't know when he sleeps, when he gets up, because I always see him interacting with people with COVID again, picking up a lot of interaction, a lot of discussions, a lot of things running in mind. Still on a Sunday, he has taken a lot of time to come here. So special thanks to Sir, uh, Paul Sir for coming here. And obviously our superstars, uh, our orthopedician, Ved Prakash Sir, our uh, neuro, uh, neurosurgeon, uh, Ravi Simon Sir, and wonderful effort uh, by our physiotherapy team, Dr. Rajesh. So it's really nice to have all of you. So I welcome all of you for the program and I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. We will also uh, request you to speak few words on this occasion. Um, I am happy to be on this uh, task. It is uh, my uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, actually, I didn't uh, come from Odisha. Uh, because I am doing my PhD here at NIMS. So, uh, I am doing my PhD uh, in orthopedics and uh, that's why I am staying here in Hyderabad now. Uh, I have taken study leave from SD Nirta. So, that is a National Institute, Swami Vivekananda National Institute of Rehabilitation, Training and Research. So, I am a faculty there and uh, I have taken study leave to do my PhD here. And uh, this is a very good initiative uh, because as uh, Sir told, this is a teamwork. This is a coordination between the physiotherapist and the neurosurgeons and the orthopedic surgeons for any uh, rehabilitation to be successful. So uh, I have found very good uh, uh, teamwork and a very good uh, interaction between uh, all the departments, multidisciplinary team. So this will really uh, is which is very much essential for the patients. And uh, first time I am traveling, uh, means I am coming to this uh, Vishwada hospital, and uh, uh, I haven't seen, but still uh, I found this uh, hospital to be uh, highly you know, like uh, technological, very much advanced. And uh, doctors are also uh, like uh, superior uh, advanced technologies. Uh, as I have heard, uh, they are uh, conducting good surgeries. surgeries. And uh, so this will definitely improve the uh, outcome on the part of the patient and also the surgeons and also the therapist. Thank you. Pleasure is ours, ma'am. And next we will uh, call on our dynamic guest, Karte, to speak few words. Good morning to one and all. My name is Karte. My age is 18 years old. I am a sports person, a weight lifter, national medals, and nine medals. I am a couple of hospital kids. Patient me, Travis Thomas are patient me. Then after that, competition national side can throw that India camp select also change. After three months, then train is done. India that one hour only. One week back, now last year tour only did. After one week back, then back in your L4 L5 disc bulge or whatever, then return now. Or just such thing only. Throw that in four hospitals only. Okay, ten fifteen hospitals only. No, four doctors can consult only. No, can you walk under? I am not ready. I am not happy with it. इनका नो करियर स्टॉप जाए सिंदे आ इनका आईपीएन देने दी इनका नो इनका वेट लिफ्टिंग जाए सिंदे का बैक इंजर और इंजर आईपी इंटरनल में पड़ी पॉल्स होता था इंटे इनका अटला चाल आस्पल से रिया इनका तरावता ना कविसुमन सर कविसुमन सर कंसल दे यानो के तरो सार ना करनो चाल मंच हो भी चाह सार ना बोल इतना डिस्कर्स 
ట్రైన్ <laughs> వాకింగ్ చేయడానికి కూడా చాలా ఇబ్బంది అయ్యేది వాకింగ్ అండ్ ఫ్లెక్స్ ఫ్లెక్సిబిలిటీ ఎనీ స్ట్రెచింగ్ ఎక్సర్సైజెస్ అవన్నీ చాలా నాకు చాలా ఇబ్బంది అయ్యేది సార్ అయితే ఎప్పుడైతే నేను కన్సల్ట్ అయ్యానో సార్ ఇంకా సార్ ట్రీట్ చేయడం వల్ల నాకు ఒక వన్ మంత్ ఫుల్ రికవరీ అయిపోవడం వల్ల నేను మళ్ళీ బ్యాక్ టు ప్రాక్టీస్ అండ్ ఐ హ్యావ్ మొన్న రీసెంట్ గా సీనియర్ స్టేట్మెంట్ జరిగింది ఎల్బీ స్టేడియం లో అందులో నేను గోల్డ్ మెడల్ తీసుకున్నాను వన్ ట్వంటీ ఎయిట్ స్నాచ్ వన్ ట్వంటీ ఎయిట్ స్నాచ్ వన్ టూ వన్ సిక్స్టీ ఫైవ్ కేజీ టోటల్ టూ నైంటీ త్రీ కేజీస్ నేను లిఫ్ట్ చేశాను అక్కడ తెలంగాణ స్ట్రాంగ్ మ్యాన్ అండ్ బెస్ట్ గిఫ్ట్ అవార్డు కూడా నాకు టైటిల్ ఇచ్చారు అక్కడ తర్వాత ఇంకా నేను ఇంటర్నే నేను రవి సుమన్ సార్ కి కాల్ చేశాను ఇంకా సార్ నన్ను ఈ రోజు మీ వల్లనే నేను ఈ స్టేజ్ లోకి వచ్చాను నాకు మీరు ఒక లైఫ్ చూపించారు అని చెప్పి నేను చాలా హ్యాపీ ఫీల్ అయ్యాను సార్ ఇంకా నెక్స్ట్ రోజు నేను కాల్ చేసి చెప్పాను సార్ ఒకవేళ నాకు ఎప్పుడన్నా ఏమన్నా ప్రాబ్లం ఉన్న ఇప్పుడు మామూలు వేరే డాక్టర్స్ ఎట్లా ట్రీట్ చేస్తారో నాకు తెలియదు కాకపోతే రవి సుమన్ సార్ మాత్రం చాలా కోఆపరేటివ్ గా చాలా కోఆపరేటివ్ గా ఉంటారు నాతో ఎప్పుడైనా పేషెంట్స్ తో నాకు ఆ విషయం తెలిసింది సార్ దగ్గర నుంచి ఇప్పుడు బయట మనం ఏ డాక్టర్స్ కెళ్ళినా చాలా బిజీ ఉంటారు మనకి సరిగా టైం ఇవ్వరు మాట్లాడడానికి కూడా కానీ సార్ ఎప్పుడు ఎంత బిజీ ఉన్నా కానీ నా కాల్ ఒకవేళ కట్ చేసిన వెంటనే వాట్సాప్ లో మెసేజ్ పెట్టేస్తారు సార్ ప్రాబ్లం ఏంటని చెప్తే సార్ వెంటనే రిప్లై ఇస్తారు ఇంకా నాకు ఎప్పుడు ఏం ప్రాబ్లం వచ్చినా ఏం చేసినా నేను ఎంటనే సార్ కాల్ చేసి ఇది సార్ ఇది పొజిషన్ అని చెప్తే సార్ ఎంటనే సరే ఒకసారి రా హాస్పిటల్ చూద్దామని చెప్పేసి సార్ నేను ఇప్పటి వరకు సార్ దగ్గర నుంచి నేను ట్రీట్మెంట్ అయ్యి తీసుకుని వెళ్ళినప్పటి నుంచి ఒకసారి నేను మళ్ళీ రాలేదు మళ్ళీ సార్ నాకు ఈ ప్రాబ్లం ఉందని చెప్పి ఇంతకుముందు వేరే వన్ ఇయర్ మొత్తం నేను హాస్పిటల్స్ తిరగడానికి టైం వేస్ట్ అయిపోయింది అది ఒక ఇప్పుడు ఒక స్పోర్ట్స్ పర్సన్ ఒక సిక్స్ మంత్స్ కంటిన్యూలీ సిక్స్ మంత్స్ ట్రైనింగ్ చేస్తున్నాడు అంటే ఒక వన్ వీక్ వన్ వీక్ రెస్ట్ ఇచ్చిన కానీ టూ మంత్స్ ట్రైనింగ్ బ్యాక్ పడిపోతాం మనం వన్ మంత్ టూ మంత్స్ ట్రైనింగ్ మొత్తం ఇంకా పడిపోతాం అట్లాంటిది ఒక రోజు కూడా రెస్ట్ ఇవ్వకుండా మనం కంపల్సరీ అందులో కూడా రికవరీ స్టేజెస్ ఉంటాయి మళ్ళీ మనం తీసుకునే ప్రోటీన్స్ కంటెంట్స్ అవన్నీ సప్లిమెంట్స్ అవన్నీ ఉంటాయి దాన్ని బట్టి మనం అన్ని యూజువల్ గా నడుచుకుంటే వెళ్ళాలి కాబట్టి నేను వన్ ఇయర్ మొత్తం నేను రెస్ట్ తీసుకున్న తర్వాత కూడా నేను మళ్ళీ రికవర్ అయ్యి ఇంత నేను సార్ సార్ కన్సల్ట్ అవ్వకముందు నేను మామూలుగా వన్ సిక్స్టీ ఓన్లీ టోటల్ వన్ సిక్స్టీ కేజీస్ నేను లిఫ్ట్ చేసుకోండి తర్వాత సార్ కి కన్సల్ట్ అయిన తర్వాత నేను స్ట్రెంత్ ఎక్సర్సైజ్ అవన్నీ ఫిజియోథెరఫీ అవన్నీ చేయించుకున్న తర్వాత మొత్తం టూ నైన్టీ త్రీ కేజీస్ వరకు నేను లిఫ్ట్ చేయగలుగుతున్నాను అది నాకు చాలా హ్యాపీ ఇప్పుడు మళ్ళీ నాకు సీనియర్ నేషనల్స్ ఉన్నాయి మళ్ళీ జూనియర్ నేషనల్స్ ఉన్నాయి ఇప్పుడు దానికోసం ప్రిపేర్ అవుతున్నాను మళ్ళీ యాజ్ యూజ్ గా నేను ఇండియా క్యాంప్ సెలెక్ట్ అవుతాను కంపల్సరీ మన ఇండియా కోసం మెడల్ చేస్తానని కోరుకుంటున్నాను Thank you, Karthik, and all the best. Sir, we will have some answer. We would like to hear a few words from you, his mentor. So, basically, what he was having was a simple problem, uh, which if diagnosed clinically and uh, treated in the right time uh, with intervention and physio, uh, would benefit many patients whom we see in a normal day-to-day life. So, we didn't do any great magic with him. We just followed the basics. And I think that's very important to have our basics right. And uh, a good uh, teamwork like Dr. Vedh Prakash always stresses because surgery is only one part of what we do, surgery or intervention. I would say only 30%. Rest 70% I tell my patients also is with physiotherapy. And throughout our career, my career, wherever whichever branch of Yeshwada I have worked, I have always been helped by physiotherapy. faculty and they do a great job here and very happy that I work in this place. Thank you. Thank you so much sir. Vedra Prakash sir. Sir, few words from you as well. Yeah, it's a good initiative. Uh, initially we thought that uh, Covid might actually uh, affect our plans but uh, seeing the enthusiasm it is uh, really good and uh, Uh, aptly named as uh, Yali, so it's a true 
that of relation and friendship between the surgeons and physiotherapists, which is very, very important, uh, especially after arthroscopic surgeries, uh, as well as uh, telling in my talk as well. 70% uh, is uh, how the post-op physiotherapy and rehabilitation goes. Uh, that really uh, optimizes outcomes. And I thank uh, Dr. Pawan, Sakati, and uh, the faculty, Madam uh, Nidhar, for coming out with this suggestion. And uh, we will certainly liaise with the physiotherapy department and uh, continue this program every once in three months as a district by Mr. Sakati. And uh, thank you once again for the management for this opportunity. Thank you all for your wonderful speeches. Now we would like to start a presentation program. Sir, I would request Karthi sir to felicitate Pawan sir. We uh, request our director to felicitate our guest for today who has won a lot of accolades for the state and nation as well. You would like to invite him? Okay. from our side, uh, Sujata Maharadi Madam. First, our unit head, Karthi sir, to felicitate our director who has taken time out of his very busy schedule. Being uh, ed by education, he is a by but by life, he is leading an entrepreneur. Leadership is showing the entire entire group of us. He is a living example of uh, hard work and dedicated work. Thank you very much, sir. We would like to invite uh, our chief physiotherapist and group head and uh, who is a resident at Yashoda Hospital, Sindhrabad, to say a few words. Uh, 
Just I would like to say how the physiotherapy developed in our organization. I started my journey here in 2008. We started in 500, 500 SFT department. Okay, recently we are coming up with uh, uh, one of the India's best hospital in high-tech city. They, our MD has given us 7,000 SFT departments. Okay. And, uh, I would like to say that not only uh, see here, not only a good service of physiotherapy we are giving, uh, we are here with two colleges. One is Ashoda College of Physiotherapy, affiliated to Sikindarabad Ashoda, and the other one is Ashoda Institute of Physiotherapy, affiliated to Somaji Buddha. And name the best university in India, like Manipal, SRM, SRMC, Nirtar, okay, Alawi Professional University. We have all the faculties teaching in our institute. Okay, we have 50 plus 50 uh, students. And next year, we are coming up with a uh, master's in physiotherapy program. And I requested my MD, we should not uh, run a program like other colleges. We should run a program like how the program runs in Manipal. So immediately he has accepted, and we are coming up with classrooms in Barakli, in Hightech City, and Sikindrabad, and Somaji Buddha. And like how the DMP program runs for the medical faculty, like that we are going to run a uh, program in, uh, uh, in our Ishoda group. So whatever the student studies in the textbook, our motto is, he has to see those patients in, in person in person so that we can give some protective physiotherapy stuff, stuff to the uh, society. I think this is very much required as our bill mentioned that physiotherapy has reached a certain level that we can diagnose. We can diagnose. For diagnosing means interaction is very, very important. That's the reason we have come up with the concept of ARI. ARI. So here, Many, many of the times we see that when the orthopedician comes, the physiotherapy will be going for other way. We want the physiotherapist should stand in front of a doctor and he has to explain boldly, okay, he has to be outspoken and he has to explain the concept and what are our observations. So we need to build some courage in the physiotherapy and we need to improve the communication skills and we need to improve the clinical skills. That's the reason we have come up with a good, two good institutes. So I request you guys to come our institute. It's in uh, uh, Gaudavalli, okay, Gullapojampalli. Okay, it's in Five Acre Campus. Two institutes are there in Five Acre Campus. I can proudly say it is one of the best institute in APN Telangana. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sumant, and uh, thanks. A special thanks for Sumant, uh, Rajesh, and all the team here for organizing this wonderful thing and all the faculty. And uh, I think we'll at least get some tea and breaks, I think, now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. We'll break for tea, 15 minutes, and then after the tea break, we'll have an interesting session about uh, radio frequency ablation and then neck pain answers. All of you can go for the tea break. The right side.
I would request Dr. Ravisuman Reddy, sir, uh, consultant neuro and spine surgeon, chief neuro radio surgery, to continue with the session, sir. So after the wonderful uh, first session, so we are ready for the second session. So basically I am going to talk on uh, percutaneous spine intervention. So many of you might be wondering, I am talking about spine intervention and percutaneous. So basically it's non-operative ways of treating uh, back pain and neck pain with all spinal issues. These are all daycare procedures, uh, patient gets admitted into daycare and uh, is discharged after a few hours. And uh, we have had very good results and after this uh, we advise them for uh, generally rest and medication for a couple of weeks. They can do their normal activities and then followed by aggressive and good physiotherapy and many of them go back to normalcy. Basically we are trying to break the pain cycle and uh, trying to give confidence to the person that he can live pain free and without surgery. So if you look at evolution of man. Have you ever come across uh, disc problems in uh, quadrupeds? I asked many of my veterinary colleagues and all. They said it's it, it's not at all there. Any spine issue is not there. Unfortunately, humans, uh, in the process of evolution, we decided to stand upright, and that's when gravity, you know, has started playing on the spine. And the reason for spine issues is because one of our ancestors decided to stand up, and you can blame our ancestors for what we have. Similar to human evolution, neurosurgery is also evolving. Initially it was macroscopic era, now then the microscopic era, then we went to the neuroendoscopic. You know, it's like looking through the keyhole. Now we come to percutaneous procedures where there's no need for any surgery and all uh, to be done and all. So, so first thing is a few cases I will show. Uh, cervical radicular pain, many times we come across patients with a small disc prolapse laterally located, severe neck pain and arm pain, radicular pain. When you examine, there are no deficits. Now, majority of neurosurgeons advise immediate surgery for these patients, means if they don't improve the medications. Uh, the thought process is for a small disc without deficits, can there be any ways of avoiding surgery? So some people, patients, you know, go for physio. So what I would advise is refrain from doing active physiotherapy when the patient is having acute radicular pain. It doesn't augur well for the patient or for the pathology of the disease. So in these kind of cases, where the only lateral disc, it's not a central disc prolapse which has myopathy and all which is, uh, you know, with the spastic paraparesis or quadriparesis, those kind of things I would advise surgery, but not for cervical disc laterally uh, present and with radicular pain. So in these cases, so what we do is uh, we, we do simple cervical interlaminar injections. So this is for a C67 disc. You can see that this is the AP view. Needle we are placing in the AP view in the C67 interlaminar space. Then we do a special view called the contralateral oblique view on X-rays. If you can see, those are the lamina and uh, we are just going, the needle is going in between the lamina and then we inject the dye into the epidural space. And this guy, after injecting the dye, we inject canogot and bupivacaine, which reduces the inflammation of the uh, on the nerve. And also, because of the pressure we inject, this disc moves with one to two millimeters, and then the patient gets immediate relief. Tremendous results with this technique. From the last five years, I only operated on two cases uh, of cervical disc after doing this procedure. We would have done more than 500 procedures on cervical disc with radiculopathy. Simple daycare procedure, three hours patient is discharged, 90% pain is relieved immediately, the rest few weeks and then good physiotherapy, good strengthening exercises, very, very less recurrences. This is how the dye spread is there to all the roots you can see. Now, sometimes we come across operative cases where you know somebody has done a spine fixation but patient still has complaints of neck pain, arm pain, doesn't reduce we do the MRI, then we realize it may be an adjacent segment level or at that level the compression is not relieved. Even for these cases, you can see that there is a platens 
uh, screws in situ, but we do these injections, you can see. That is a, a needle pro progressing into the epidural space, and that's a good dye spread, and then we inject. So, cervical disc prolapses, very good results. Without deficits, definitely I would advise, if med with medicines they are not working, better is to go for this procedure. Other important aspects is facet arthropathy. So normally, during my training in remands, uh, we were so inundated with regular cases that we never think about the possibility of uh, facet arthropathy, either cervical or back pain as a cause of back pain. Majority of times, we think it is spine and disc only. Unfortunately, there are many things which comprise the spine, and the joints where the micro movements are happening are the most, uh, you know, liable for arthropathy. Just like how knee joint osteoarthritis or sex because the movements are tremendous and these are small joints. So, symptoms are muscle spasms, restricted joint movements, feeling of bone rubbing against another, and mild radiating pain to the posterior of your thigh. How many of you see these symptoms in daily practice? Please lift your hands. Majority of us, majority of us see these uh, symptoms. Unfortunately, then somebody does an MRI and MRI shows a disc prolapse and then every doctor is chasing the disc prolapse, saying disc prolapse. But disc is not the cause of back pain in more than 90% of cases. So basically, this facet joint is supplied by the medial nerve arising from the nerve root, which is a sensory nerve root to the facet joint. So what we do is use a radio ablation machine and uh, we connect the needle, we put the needle fluoroscopically guided near the facet joint and we identify the medial nerve to the facet joint and we ablate that nerve joint. So once we do that, the patient gets immediate pain relief. That's what we did with Karthik also. Actually, he was having facet arthropathy. Patient, people were misdiagnosing to have a disc prolapse, advising various therapies which were not working. So basically, we were looking somewhere else when the pathology was somewhere. It's a local uh, anesthesia procedure, patient is conscious and so this is how we identify, this is for an L5-S1 facet, we put the needle, connect it to the electrode. Okay, this is a video which shows that connecting to the electrode. And then when, after connecting to the electrode, what we do is we do a motor and sensory stimulation to identify whether this is the exact medial nerve to the facet. So in that case, only the multifidus movement moves actually. See, if you see that, this is the movement of the multifidus movement, uh, muscle. At this time, we should identify that there is no movement in the leg because we should not be, uh, you know, updating the, um, uh, the sciatic nerve or the, you know, other roots. So once we identify that exactly this is a nerve root, uh, uh, the medial nerve root to the facet joint, then we go ahead and ablate with the radiofrequency ablation. Similarly, cervical facet syndrome, very commonly seen in population, severe neck pain, no radicular pain. You do an MRI, it shows spondylosis and some discs and then everybody says you have disc prolapse, you need to go in for surgery. Similar procedure can be done, daycare procedure. These are all the various dermatomes where we see that facet joint pain can be elicited. Uh, majority of times with simple radio frequency ablation, these get very well done. Another important thing which we see in practice is coccidemia, tailbone pain. Very common, lot of physio uh, activities done and even the sacral pillow doesn't work much, but radio frequency works amazingly for this patient, as much as for a cervical disc. So, very good results. So what we do is, yeah, you know coccidemia it is pain while sitting or getting up from sitting, uh, just about the anus area, patient improves while leaning forward, but local tenderness is also very severe. So, we put a needle through the sacrum, uh, the, the coccygeal segments into a area, the presacral area, where we have the ganglion impar. So, this is the ganglion which supplies the sensory nerves to the coccyx area. So, we connect the needle to the electrode and ablate it, then the patient gets pain relief immediately and it is very long sustained. Then some physio exercises and then uh, some anti-neuropathic medications definitely help. So this is how we go with the needle. I will show you also the CM images where you can see. See, we are going with the needle through the the, the coccygeal segments into the presacral area, injecting the dye to identify the good spread, and then we connect to the radio frequency machine and the ablation is done. We also follow it up with the caudal block. 
we inject into the cardiac epidural space so that all the nerve roots also we reduce the inflammation. So a coxic, a coxidemia patient with a radio frequency, you do a cardiac block, almost 95 to 98 percent the patient pain is relieved. Another important thing which we see in practice is SA joint strain. Very commonly seen, very commonly misdiagnosed. Many times patients come to me saying that somebody is advised surgery for a disc prolapse. When we identify the tenderness is at the SA joint, there is no radicular pain at all. So completely a situation where the problem is somewhere and we are looking somewhere. Unfortunately, we are in the era of MRI where, you know, as soon as the MRI is done, we stop seeing the patient, we only look at the MRI. That's why when a patient comes to me in my chamber, I never look at the MRI in the first instance. I tell them, first tell me your problem, examine clinically, then only see the MRI. So this is the arthritic, uh, you know, the regular uh, arthritic uh, uh, sacroiliac joint. So this is again very commonly seen in post-operative spinal fixation patients because of loss of sagittal joint at the balance. The strain is obviously on the SA joint. So, Patient after surgery is not happy, goes back to the doctor and says, Sir, you have operated, I am still having pain. Surgeon will not bother to examine because he feels he has done the surgery probably. Maybe the patient is having psychosomatic issues. I have seen patients being referred to psychiatry also, saying that surgery is good, rods, uh, the, spine, the screws and rods are in position, MRI looks good. Unfortunately, clinically, the pain is in the SA joint. So, you identify the SA joint, very simple, put the needle into the place. See, you can see the die spread perfectly going into the SA joint. Then once we localize it, then we connect it to the electrode and do the radio frequency ablation. Works very well for these patients. This is, again we do a cordon so that we soothe the nerves. Lumbar disc is also, nowadays in my practice, if it is a small to medium disc, first I would give a trial of uh, transforaminal injections, although radio frequency doesn't work much for them. But definitely transforaminal injections work well. This is a transforaminal injection of the L5 root. You can see. Selective root, nerve root blocks, which work very well. And this is a S1. So for L5 S1 disc prolapses, see this beautifully, you can see the entire nerve root. Then we inject the drug, uh, bupivacaine and kinopod. Very good pain relief. If case they come back early, then we plan for surgery. Otherwise, majority of the times we can avoid surgery. This is one more uh, L5 nerve root. So, to sum it up, you know, uh, how many of you identify this picture? What is it called? Any guesses? This image? You have not seen this picture before? It's a very famous drawing, you know. Nobody. So it's, called, it's a Vitruvian man, okay. This is a Leonardo da, da, da Vinci, you know, uh, masterpiece. If you see, you know, it's it, it's a perfect amalgamation of uh, body physique as well as, you know, the fitness and within the dynamics of the, you know, the uh, physics and uh, all the motions. So we should have to aim patients like this, you know, because we should have fit patients and we should use all the modalities to help them, you know, do well. And uh, following the theme of evolution, uh, you know, when we start doing anything new, there's a lot of hindrance and a lot of comments from colleagues and peers. So, but we should be unperturbed by them. I never ever get perturbed by them. Many people say that, oh, sir, he stopped operating. He's doing only no radio frequency. It's not like that. We should be good in every technique, whether operative, non-operative, medical, setting length of physiotherapy. The ideal scenario is you should do justice to the patient. So always, you know, it is not the strongest of the species or the most intelligent that survives, but the one that is most adaptable to change. So unless you adapt to change and find out new technologies, embrace them, and find out if it works for your patients and take it forwards, you are going to be extinct. So that's the advice I have for people who say that, you know, that's why, you know, that, that is when the topic comes. Many patients come to me saying that uh, we had disc prolapse. They have gone for uh, Ayurvedic massage in Kerala. And they have called, uh, become good and come back. And there's a guy in Bangalore where two or three of my relatives too went in spite of my advice that I will treat them. He does something with a coin. We should even look at all this also. Maybe, maybe there is some science to it, you know. Otherwise, why are patients getting treated? 
So all modalities should work together and then only you know evolution occurs. Otherwise, you know, if we think our department is good or our treatment is good, it doesn't work out like that. So that's a take home message. Embrace all technologies, find out what works for our patient best. When we are doing justice in that way, then only the patient benefits. Thank you. Have you heard of these procedures before, before coming to the desktop? No? No? You see that? Why is it for me only, Yeah, that's because you worked with the students. So that's the problem, you know. I mean, first is we are not aware of these procedures. And I'm not blaming you, but even majority of my colleagues also are not aware of these procedures. So, it's really, I mean, it has made a vast difference in the way I practice nowadays. Because, Nowadays, I don't look at surgery as the first option. I look at surgery as the last option. Earlier, we used, I used to put them on a pregabalin, neuromethylcobalamin, or send for physiotherapy, but you know, some, many of the times it doesn't work out unless you deal with the pathology. And what I also feel is that once we break the pain cycle, that's when physio acts the best. Because after you break the pain cycle, when you do proper physiotherapy, then you are treated for life. Once your core muscle strength comes back, then you don't have recurrences. So, yes, that, that is also my experience. Very few people know about this procedure. I hope uh, you tell patients that these kind of options are available. Very, very less price compared to normal surgeries. Daycare, there is no side effect. I'm telling you, that should 100%, there are hardly any side effects with this. There is no side effects. Many people have misconception. Put a needle, there are complications. There are no complications with this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Next, I would like to call upon Dr. Rajesh Reddy, uh, HOD of Department of Physiotherapy. Sir, one uh, query from the yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, no, without physio nothing works. I mean, uh, those who are... Uh, no, let me assure you. See, epidural neuroplasty is... Yeah, we, we, we inject other uh, things like, you know, um, papain sometimes or, you know, uh, which are lysing the additions. So there are other procedures also which we do. These are the basic ones. We send catheters from the caudal area and uh, we strip off the additions and we inject all these uh, injections to additionalysis and all that. But let me assure you, even if you operate or if you do these interventions, we are only causing pain relief. Okay, So we are breaking the cycle of pain. Now, what is the pathology for the disc prolapse? What do you think? Is caused, what is the cause of disc prolapse? Tell me. No, 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 I'm not. The biomechanics, if you see, it is, the, you're not taking proper care of the structural mechanisms of your spine. That is your, yeah, muscle and ligaments and all that, you know. If these are strong enough, you do proper physiotherapy or regular exercises which you do, you will never get disc prolapses. So we are only doing a temporary solution. That's what I always advise my patients. We are only doing temporary. What you have to go is go back to your physiotherapist, work out a regime and do proper physiotherapy. Then only you will not get recurrences. Otherwise I will treat you now. You go back and start doing the same shit you were doing earlier. You will come back to me and again I have to treat you. So that is where the importance is. So always these are all we are giving confidence to the patient. Like see Karthik, we gave him confidence that he can be pain free. Once he had pain-free period, then he went to physiotherapy, then he realized that yes, I can be pain-free, I can do things what I am doing and now he is doing better than what he was doing before. So that is the confidence we have to give to patients. Same way we are intervening, that's why I said the Ayurvedic people or some homeo, unani, they also, maybe psychological or with medications, they also provide pain-free intervals. So whatever it is, that is the best thing we can do to the patient. Uh, injecting this uh, 
right? Then later if we with the L2, L3, then the same procedure will do this. Uh, yeah, we can do it at L2, 3 level. But see, if after this he takes care, then. No, 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 nothing. No harm. This is a topical. What you are giving is directly on the nerve. It's in the epidural space. So it is. There is no side effects. That 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 concept that it is harmful. You forget about it. We have done now more than five thousand procedures. There is not in not a single complication which occurs. If you do properly, that's why you have to do under CM fluoroscopy. Why I'm injecting the dye to be hundred percent sure that we are targeting the right place. Many people will give injections without using fluoroscopy or dye. You don't know where you are injecting actually. You can go into muscle because loss of resistance can occur anywhere. Muscle, ligament, bone, wherever you want it can last. So do it in the right way. Use the proper, like right now we have the radio frequency machine. When you are ablating the nerve, we will do motor as well as sensory stimulation to identify the correct nerve and then only ablate it. So if you do blindly or without proper equipment, you don't get good results. Okay. They like they say no, like yeah, that's how it is. Thank you. No age factor, sir. No age factor at all. It's just that patient has to be cooperative enough to lie down on the table in the prone position. So some very rare cases we have seen severe asthmatic or COPD patients, they cannot lie down prone, for them we could not do the procedure. Otherwise, 99.9 percent, there is no age restriction. And if on antiplatelets, we tend to stop for three to five days because finally we are intervening with the spinal cord, so we don't want any complications. Sir, is there any contraindication for this? Same, like I said, hematological problems, uh, plasma dyscrasias, where you coagulation factor and all are. Otherwise, you know, there is no contraindication. Sir, radio frequency means uh, for a cancer patient. Yeah, if cancer pain again is different, cancer patients. we can do this for cancer patients also. If it is having, suppose, uh, pain associated with that root, sometimes you have metastasis with nerve power of root uh, irritation, then we can do this procedure. There is no contraindication. There is no contraindication. Madam, US FDA says uh, for back pain, it lasts for three years. It's a US FDA approved procedure. Yes. But then again, you have to do physiotherapy. So many times, you know, a patient gets relieved of the pain and then goes back to his normal life. It cannot be like that. So like I said, core muscle strengthening is the main thing to prevent recurrences. Yes. It's a US FDA approved procedure. So if the patient is not able to maintain physiotherapy, yeah. there is a recurrence. Can you do the same process and same side again? Yeah, we can do it multiple number of times. No issues at all. I generally refrain for about one week to ten days because you know the needles know that soreness of muscle will be there. So generally I am a very conservative person in the initial one week or ten days. I will tell them don't intervene. I don't send my patients to our physio people also. But at the follow up I will make sure they go. I will give my assistant, let, make sure they go to the physiotherapy room then only we will come back. I will never leave the patient late. Because finally if they don't go then he will come back with recurrence and my procedure will be blamed, so I don't want it. Uh, so there is an ulterior motive also. Sir, so, uh, normally they say ignorance is bliss, but in this pr procedures, you should never be ignorant because otherwise you will end up with under the scalpel of a surgeon. So, uh, when we started, you know, we, we started slowly and all and now there are days when you know we do five to seven procedures also because the number of patients who are benefiting and it all word of mouth. Like he is treated, he tells few people, so it's all like that. And best thing is in a corporate setup also we are able to reduce the price of treatment. So it's a very uh, affordable treatment you know. Somebody says two lakhs, two and a half lakhs for surgery, everybody thinks twice. If I say 25,000 or 30,000 or 15,000 at all, then people are easily amenable for this treatment. So that's the best advantage we are having. So And there's no recurrent cost because it's just one time you buy a machine and then rest of the things are all very small consumables, that's not a problem. So affordability, accessibility and good results, I think that's the reason for our success. So we need to add something. Yeah, please. So, I, mean, uh, I think uh, I just want to add this uh, radio frequency ablation. So I am dealing with the most of US clients. 
So in US, it's the most common yes, procedure. Yes, very common. It's the most common procedure. Mm -hmm. We did almost 60 to 70 cases in US. So we usually check all these medical records and all. So whenever the patient comes with a back pain, most of the cases we see is a painkiller injections. That is one thing, and the radio frequency ablation. So these are the most. I mean, I think uh, you are saying I heard first time here. Yeah, yeah. I Normally, know. I didn't heard. Uh, it's no, in US, also. that's that's how it is. In that's US, it's very word. common. You don't send a patient for surgery in the US unless he undergoes these procedures. And actually, you know, even for disc surgeries, they make sure you give a transfer aminal and say that you are having good result. That patient only, when he has a recurrence, when you operate, will have a good result with surgery. So it's clearly defining what uh, patients will improve. And the word of uh, sir said, uh, we have to treat the root. Yeah. Rather than treating the branches and the leaves, yeah, yeah, that is the main right. reason. So when we are treating the root cause, obviously it is giving a 90% of result. Then the remaining part is the post strengthening. The the patient part will come along with the physio and all. Why I'll tell you one more thing is I have not mentioned about that in my talk. Majority of times patient come to you with pain, you find that they have trigger points. Just a small trigger point injection in a dressing room will cure them. I have seen many times. So, generally what happens as surgeons, when we operate post-operatively, patient complains of pain, although we have done a good job surgically, we develop a hindrance to looking at other things in the patient. You know, just because a patient comes back post-op and says pain, doesn't always mean recurrence. So, we have to keep our mind open. So, initial part of my career, I used to wonder, I have done a good job, I have removed the disc, I have seen all the roots decompressed, why is he still complaining of pain, is he psychiatric? Shall I refer him to psycho? Then I realize that they may have many other issues, like a small trigger point pain will be there, just adjacent to the incision. Or there may be, like I said, postoperatively very common SA joint strain. Simple injections, they treat well. So always clinical examination is the most important part in spine. Without clinical examination, MRI and all is bullshit actually. Because any MR, even if you do for normal people also, multiple disc prolapse. And what complicates issues is our radiologists know. They will mention every small thing, ligament, spine, disc. So people will be very worried. Sir, nowadays people are more reliant on Google rather than doctors. Yeah. <laughs> we search everything in Google. Yeah, but see, there is an advantage with Google also. See, like. There is an advantage. Yeah, yeah. So but you have to take. You have to, you, you have to, you know, filter whatever information you get. So that's left to us. Uh, because see, like, uh, you mentioned Google, so I'll tell you. So people come to me, I tell this procedure, I write it down in capital letters, radio frequency ablation. I will tell, please Google this, <laughs> see videos, come back to me, then I will explain to you. You know, that makes sense also. Just Google it, you will find everything. And I'll, I'll also tell you, majority of the patients I get are also through Google. Because people like Karthik give a review of me on Google saying that this doctor treats without surgery. And many of them see the reviews and come to me saying that, sir, we saw in Google that you are a neurosurgeon who are doing some new radio frequency procedures, you are not operating, you are making people better. So invariably per day at least two to three patients come only through these reviews. So it's, it's a very important tool actually. And like, you know, Everything which has useful will also have a negative aspect. It all depends on how we balance it. That's all. No more questions? Okay, thank you. We can go to the next topic. Thank you so much for the Next, uh, we'll go on with the next session from Dr. Rajesh Reddy, HOD of Physiotherapy Department, Somaji Guda. Very good afternoon to all of you. A very fruitful and interactive session with
Therapy means mechanical diagnosis and therapy. Where Sahar was uh, telling about uh, mechanically how uh, things uh, go about and how you have to rely not mostly on the investigations but on the physical examination. That is what uh, McKenzie has uh, advised from 1950s. So McKenzie approach, all of you know as a physiotherapist, what is McKenzie approach? So all of you have some idea about what is McKenzie approach. So whenever we tell about McKenzie word, what comes to your mind? McKenzie means what comes to your mind? Extension of mostly one uh, back extension exercise is common, and we also get prescription many times. Uh, back extension exercise is a standard prescription for any back pain, non-specific back pain, uh, back pain cases. So, uh, any other thing, back extension exercise, anything comes to your mind apart from back extension exercise regarding McKenzie? Other than that, McKenzie is from New Zealand and other things. Again, so, same thing. Generally, we have an idea. McKenzie means extension exercise. We can do extension exercise. So, we will see whether that is uh, whole truth or partial truth. So, McKenzie is extension exercise. That is one concept. McKenzie has flexion exercise, lateral flexion other exercise also. We will see. McKenzie is for spine only, back and neck at least. That is what the idea. McKenzie is for spine and extremities and for a whole lot of things is being developed now. That also we will just briefly discuss. And McKenzie is not manual therapy, it is only exercise or really there is some manual therapy involved in that. These things just will get an idea. We are not going into deep or anything, but getting a picture of what is McKenzie, how we can use it in our daily practice. So why neck pain? The answer is all of you are doing back extension exercise. So all of you know that McKenzie means you can do extension exercise in the back. But generally you know, we get a prescription neck means poor neck always have only isometric neck exercise. Other than that, there are no much exercise awareness regarding neck. Whereas back we have core strengthening, uh, back extension exercise, all these things are known to people. Whereas neck, when it comes to neck, it's always isometric neck exercise. So maybe I thought I will deal with the McKenzie concept of exercise, how we can do uh, approach neck pain. So there are various manual therapy approaches you might be as physiotherapist encountered uh, and uh, many workshops also you might have attended, Maitland, McKenzie, Mulligan. So many things are there which we can uh, classify them into four basic types is those who work on joint mostly or those who work on muscle those who work on facial dysfunction and those who work on nerve. So a small quiz we will have. So we have, if you show a, uh, say photographs of Sachin Tendulkar and uh, maybe uh, Pawan Kalyan, all of you will recognize. So how many heroes from our profession will be able to recognize? Just we'll have a small chat. Who is the first person? Anybody? First photograph, the elderly person. So these are all people who deal with joint as the uh, main concept of dealing uh, uh, musculoskeletal pain in manual therapy. Can you recognize the first person, anybody? No, no, first person will go in the heart. <laughs> McKenzie is already in the first slide, so he's no more. First slide only I kept, so I'm not going to repeat him. First person, anybody? So he's related to both physiotherapy and orthopedics. He is not a physiotherapist, but he has contributed a lot to CS, James CS. Yes. He is the father of orthopedic medicine and UK, uh, uh, who work in UK, almost everybody knows him. So he is the person who first told, the, what we have discussed, Sarah told that imaging is only for structure. But if you want to treat the patient, you find out the function of the tissue. For that you have to do physical examination. You cannot see pain, you cannot see the function of the tissue on the MRI or say X-ray or other things. So for what? That, if you want to know the function, you have to test the function. You have to test the muscle, then you know the function, how it is functioning. You test the nerve, you will know. So what he designed is called Selective Tissue Tension Test. That's what he has given to manual therapy. Uh, so he's an orthopedic medicine specialist, but he has contributed and encouraged many physiotherapists. Then who is the next one after Maitland? Uh, sorry, after CX? Maitland. He's Maitland, Jeffrey Maitland. So he's from Australia and uh, he's one of the most famous physiotherapists who has inspired many physiotherapists and uh, many people who taught me directly learned uh, manual therapy from uh, Maitland. When I was studying in Manipal, the teachers who taught me have studied under uh, Maitland in uh, Australia. So he has given the concept of recall theory and that we have to be open-minded when we are dealing with the patient uh, and we have to be attentive and we have to empathize with the patient or the basic tenets of his uh, approach. Who is the person next to him? Down? Okay. McKenzie is all, uh, I told <laughs> So he is Carl Bone. 
So he gave what all of you must be knowing, concave convex theory, most of you might have read now. Uh, in, when we are going to view the glides. So he is the one who uh, most uses the concept of con concave convex theory. And the last person is, is uh, with the color photograph with type, he is Brian Mulligan. So all of you must see, he is also from New Zealand along with McKenzie. So he has given the concept of mobilization and movement, all these things, pain release uh, technique and other things. So these are all people who dealt with joint as the main source of pain in manual therapy. So who are these funky gentlemen on the top with the color, color uh, shirt and color uh, spectacles? Anybody? David Butler. David Butler. So he is a man who has influenced what is pain. Means we have to read, Butler is one of the person who have, we have to read either we are from physiotherapy or from any profession, even we are from pain medicine. Butler and the person next to him are the ones who have contributed to the advance of pain, not for physiotherapy, for the medical fraternity. So Butler has given uh, written textbooks on mobilization of the nervous system. So he has given us techniques of how to assess the uh, mechanical adverse neural tension in the body. The person next to him with a short spectacle and short hair, Michael Shekelov. So they both were colleagues initially and they both separated and he branched out in the same thing as clinical neurodynamics. Both have dealt with how to treat a nerve, nerve injuries, nerve adhesions, adverse neural tension, mechanical uh, things uh, by manual therapy. Then the person who is uh, red shirt, uh, uh, smiling, showing under his teeth, who is the person? Yes. Thomas Myers. He is the one who gave anatomical clients the concept of fascia. Fascia is there throughout the body and fascia can cause a uh, problem anywhere. So uh, we can treat a hamstring strain or a plantar fasciitis with treating the neck. That is one of the concepts because fascia is throughout uh, uh, are those his concepts. Next one is, last person is there anywhere. Nubi Steko, he's also worked on fascia, facial manipulation is what he has specialized. Next, there are so many people on muscle, manual therapists who have worked on muscle. So, instrumental stress, so soft tissue manipulation, trigger point therapy, most of the physiotherapists do. Uh, dry needling is the trend now. The various people are there. Can you name the first people who, uh, gentleman and lady? Their name is not there here. Yes, Janet and Travel, they are physicians for American president. And they are the people who developed how to identify a trigger point and treat a Bible for trigger point therapy. They have written two volumes, they are really big size. And uh, Janet and Travel, they have written the epitomes, tomes of uh, literature on my official. They are the first people who have written about every muscle, how it will influence, uh, causes pain and how it can be dealt with. Who is the person next? Next to them. Right side, any idea? He is Vladimir Jenda. Jenda is a person who classified muscles into postural and phasic muscles and he has given the concepts of upper cross syndrome, lower cross syndrome, how, how the imbalance between muscle is causing back pain or neck pain. These are all the concepts given by Jenda. Then out of all these people, except Janet, we have one lady, individual lady. What is her name, any idea? Her name is mentioned on the screen. See Shirley Sherman and she has given the concept of movement system impairment approach. And the last person is Leanne Chaito. So he has written so many books, small small books on uh, trigger point release type only, positional release and muscle energy techniques and uh, neuromuscular techniques, all the techniques regarding uh, myofascial release. So there are so many people like this but still why I thought uh, I will speak about McKenzie. So many, many concepts are there, many things are there. Still, I have chosen the topic of McKenzie because most research method worldwide, not only physiotherapists, physicians, neurosurgeons, many people are doing research on McKenzie's concepts. So some of the concepts of physiotherapy may not be always acceptable by medical fraternity. But McKenzie's concepts are actively researched by people who are not from physiotherapy but from multidisciplinary. So the most research endorsed by science surgeons like Dr. Donaldson from USA, and it's a very simple concept, but it is a very comprehensive structure. Not only for, as I told, lumbar spine, but cervical and extremity joints also, now they have developed McKenzie approach. And when there was a voting uh, among the manual therapists, who is the person who influenced you most? Of the top manual therapists, they kept a voting, and they have given the list studies. The first one they have mentioned is, Robin McKenzie's approach has influenced my field of practice, followed by Syriac's 
then Maitland and other people you can see. Stanley Paris is also a manual therapist from USA and other things are there. So, McKenzie concept has influenced many topmost manual therapists. But we are not going into deep uh, depth of that because it will take one whole day. But what is it basically other than back extension, what you are told when I asked in the beginning, you told back extension exercise. Apart from that, is there really anything? That is the only, I am just skimming the surface. So he's the first person who told in 1950s itself that you have to empower the patient. He's not very much into passive treatment. He wants the patient to be, you, he wants collaborative treatment with the patient and patient, active treatment is required and you want to empower the patient. This is a statement he gave in 1950 when there is a biomedical approach and biopsychosocial approach was not developed, which is a current concept now. He was the first person who told that. And how it all began. Robin McKenzie's concepts have began by chance. He was also a physiotherapist who was treating with uh, regular concepts of the day in 1950s with passive modalities. Williams flexion exercise was the trend at that time. Came to him for treatment. He was coming from the last uh, Uh, whether the machine is available at that time, SW they might have kept. But when he went, the couch is head end is elevated. He thought uh, uh, the physiotherapist uh, has told me to lie down, he lie down there. And the McKenzie was involved in some other work, he could not come there for the next 20 minutes. And then after 20 minutes, he came there and he asked him to get up and then he'll check. Then the patient told, From the last six months, I am suffering from pain and I am coming for treatment from the last two, three weeks to, to you. But now is the most pain free period or the best time I have in the last six months. Then uh, he was actually uh, terrified seeing the patient lying down like that because at that time extension exercise was thought to be uh, not good and Williams flexion exercise is the concept. Then he was worried but the patient is giving a different picture. Then from then onwards uh, McKenzie started thinking what is actually happening and then he started to develop the concepts he, over a period of 20 years. By 70s or something, he has developed his own concept. So, McKenzie method is a unique and dynamic and comprehensive system which has four things that is assessment and classification of patients, treatment and prevention also. Always classification is important because if you <coughs> can classify similar patients, then you will be able to treat them better and uh, follow up the outcomes better. If you are treat giving the same treatment to every patient also, it is not good or if you are giving different treatment to different patients also not good. When you are able to identify subgroups, it is very easy to track our treatment and also find out the outcomes. So that is why McKenzie emphasizes on classification of all the patients. So he has given about uh, mechanical pain he deals with. He doesn't deal with, uh, in his concept he tells that inflammatory pain is not our thing or non-mechanical pain is not our thing, but mechanical pain comes into the purview of physical treatment. And uh, for that, there is a supporting statement from Nikolai Bogdak, who is a famous uh, anatomist who worked on International Association of uh, spy, uh, Study of Pain. And he has made a statement that mechanical deformation causes mechanical nociception. And for that, it is not the chemical uh, treatment with drugs, but you have to have a remedy with mechanically only. And he asked that all of you can bend your finger like this. All of you, just a simple activity. When you bend your finger, you will have slight strain. You keep it still more strain increases tissue then if you can keep it for five minutes you will have strain now if you keep an injection or take a drug will that pain subside or if you keep it get it back to neutral because it is, there is no chemical there is no inflammatory or nothing inside there is only a mechanical deformation you have abnormal amount of end range loading on a normal tissue that is going to give you mechanical pain further the solution is you have to again get it back to neutral position automatically pain will go so this is this is the kind of analogy he explains patients how you should correct your posture because if you keep the wrong posture for longer time mechanical pain will start so for that the remedy is you have to correct your posture and give a frequent break because every tissue will undergo deformation so you should give some chance for it to recover next as i told important concepts in is assessment classification treatment and uh, prevention so assessment like all manual therapy assessment, there is history taking and most important is red flag or serious spinal pathology. He says that we can deal with many patients but we should know whom we can treat and we also should know very important whom we cannot treat, that is red flags. First you identify red flags, refer them to the specialist, then half of your job is over. Because you are doing, if you are taking patients without knowing who are having serious spinal pathology and keep on treating for 2-3 weeks. Then you are harming the patient. 
So first thing is do not harm the patient. For that, you should have the skill to, as we are going to have some kind of independent practice also permitted over the years, you should be able to, because the patient always come to a physician or a physician directed, we are safe in the sense that we can just uh, for our treatment, we can do it without any fear of anything serious is there. But if the patient comes directly to us, we have the responsibility to identify any serious pathology is there and then send them appropriate person, appropriate consultant. Uh, and then uh, we can, if person is uh, conducive for physiotherapy only, we have continue physiotherapy. That is his motto. Then in physical examination, post stress assessment is more, uh, maximum he, assess, uh, he stresses. Then if anything is relevant, you have the uh, paresthesia and other symptoms of neurological compression, other things, then you have to do neurological assessment then regular range of motion assessment and then the speciality of McKenzie comes in the repeated movements assessment. That is the hallmark of McKenzie's uh, assessment. Then we will see briefly what is his concept there. And then at last, if nothing succeeds, he will do the sustained posture assessment. So history taking, all of you know, uh, uh, in his method, he will be asking about the occupation of the patient, what are the movements he will be doing there, leisure activities, what are the activities he will be doing, and then what is his functional status and functional limitations. Then he will go about using the body chart, location of the pain, how much distal it is there, pain, that also we have to mark it. And then we have to see a type of pain, whether it is intermittent or constant, that is very important. And then later, pain is there, what is the stage of the pain, whether it is acute, according to uh, McKenzie's concept, acute is for 7 days, subacute for about 7 weeks and beyond 7 weeks is called chronic according to his concept. And what is the status of the injury, whether it is worsening, improving or unchanging. And apart from this, what is the 24 hour pattern behavior. So how much time you are, uh, uh, if you take 24 hours as 100%, how much of time he is pain free or symptom free, whether it is 20%, 30%. Uh, if you are able to improve that percentage also, he says that it is an improvement in the patient, positive feedback to him. And then uh, about the 24 hour pattern, night sleep pattern also. If he sleeps morning when he wakes up, what is his status? Whether he is having increase in neck pain or back pain. So all this in detail, we have to take the assessment. And any previous history, what was his previous treatment and how did it work out, whether it has benefited him or loss. So as I told, red flags are signs and symptoms that raise, uh, raise suspicion of serious spinal pathology. And once red flags, we have to identify them in our patients in the first, in some, when the first visit itself, we have to see if there is any suspicion and never try to treat the patients of uh, red flags continuously with you. You have to always, when there is a suspicion, get it cleared. It may not be a red flag, but you have a suspicion, send them to the specialist, get it cleared. So easy to remember some of the red flags which we get up. One is trauma or in case of neck upper uh, uh, cervical instability or unexplained weight loss, uh, cancers. Unexplained weight loss means about 5% loss of weight in 4 weeks. It's a drastic weight loss, so you should be suspicious. And neurological findings caught, caught Cord, uh, symptoms or cordae in uh, symptoms like saddle anesthesia or uh, say uh, bladder and bone incontinence and then age greater than 55 or 65 we should be suspicious of cancer and other things. We should be careful, we should not deal with them for long without identify, without making sure that they does not have any serious spinal pathology. Fever then I means infection, infection or immunocompress and then the patient is continuously on steroids also we have to be careful and then in history of tuberculosis, cancer or any other pathological conditions. Then the first physical examination that McKenzie does is examination of posture and its effect on the body. So he will observe the patient, he will make him sit if it is possible on a unsupported chair or couch and it will take around 4 to 5 minutes to take the history part. By the time you will observe his posture, how he is able to sit, whether he is slouched and forward head posture is there, then you will correct the posture. He will make the person sit with proper lumbar lordosis and a retraction of the neck. And you will see whether that, that has any effect on the pain. Whether the pain increases or decreases. That is the first one. Assess the posture, then correct the posture and see the effect of symptom. That is pain or paresthesia, whether it has increased or decreased with the postural correction. And if there is any necessity, relevancy is there in the history for neurological symptoms, then you will go thoroughly about the neurological examination of uh, myotomes, dermatomes, as well as the reflexes to establish if any neurological uh, yeah, presentation is there or not. Then the movement assessment, first one is range of motion, regularly the neck has flexion, extension, lateral flexion and rotation. So doing the range of motion assessment, he wants to know whether range is full or it is limited. If it is limited, it is minor, major or moderate limitation is there. And if, uh, if it is limited, what is the reason, because of pain or because of stiffness. And 
if the pain is there at rest and it is there throughout or pain is starting during the movement or pain is there only at the end of movement. What is the relationship between pain and range of motion? Next one is the most important as I told movement assessment that is repeated movement assessment we will deal with now and once the repeated movement assessment is also over then last he will do again sustained posture. First he has corrected the posture, last he will make the uh, patient sit in his regular posture for five, to 5 minutes in different standing and sitting. If, if till repeated movements he doesn't get any idea about what is his symptom, last one he will do. Otherwise, if he is able to find, maybe he can skip the last one. Now we will see what is his repeated movement assessment, which is the Carlos tour of McKenzie's approach. <laughs> Before going to see that, we have to know some McKenzie's terms. McKenzie commonly uses the term, all of you must have heard, centralization, peripheralization, direct, uh, directional preference of excess. These are the things commonly used in McKenzie's terminology. Centralization means a phenomena in which distal symptoms move proximally, distal symptoms of spinal origin move proximally due to repeated movements. So what McKenzie says is that if you have neck pain which is going into your arm or maybe forearm and if you do certain movements or certain something, if the pain comes proximally, that means if the pain is there till the say below elbow, if it comes to above elbow, it is good, it is called centralization. Even if the pain increases, if the periphery centralization occurs, remaining pain intensity has increased. Say suppose you have 6 out of 10 pain but it became 8 out of 10, but centralization has occurred, then he is telling that it is a good thing, it is a good thing that it is resolving. So that is his concept of centralization. And then peripheralization means because of any movements, if the pain goes distally, the pain is there in the shoulder, it goes up to the elbow, even if the pain intensity decreases, he tells that it is not good. So peripheralization should be avoided, centralization should be actively pursued. Centralization of pain, you can see the diagram. So, if the pain starts, uh, it's going all the way to the uh, fingers and the centralization, if you apply the McKenzie concept properly, he says that pain centralizes in this sequence. And generally, when I treat a patient, I will show this figure to him, like that positive feedback. If you are having that much, no problem. There is a chance, if you are right candidate for this therapy, it can go like this. And when we show it regularly, he will only tell, exactly in my mouth, he will tell, this is my figure, this is my pain now, right now, it's like this. Uh, many patients I have seen, many VIP patients also have been dealt with the same therapy with very good results. So this is uh, centralization and the opposite is peripheralization and we should never encourage peripheralization. The pain is going mistily, that means we are doing something wrong, we have to again recheck our procedures. Then another concept similar to centralization is directional preference. Directional preference means anything which decreases or abolishes or centralizes pain. So centralization is only centralization, whereas directional preference has centralization or decrease of pain or abolishment of pain. All these things, if you in one, one side of movement, in one direction if you are doing exercise, either there is a decrease in pain or there is abolish means totally pain has gone or if there is centralization, he tells that further patient that is the directional preference. So what we have to do with the directional preference or how to find out the directional preference, we will see now. And one more important thing, if you want to summarize in one word what is McKenzie's concept means, McKenzie's concept is the symptomatic and mechanical response to repeated end range movements. Once again I am repeating, McKenzie's concept says that, McKenzie's concept depends on symptomatic and mechanical response to repeated end range loading or repeated movements. So when you do repeated movement, symptomatic response is nothing but pain or paresthesia or weakness. So if the pain or paresthesia, how they behave when you are doing repeated movements. Then mechanical means range of motion or any limitation, any deformity, all these things come under mechanical response. So when you are doing repeated movements in a patient, how the symptoms are responding, how the uh, range of motion is responding, that gives an idea about the patient's presentation. So in the neck we deal about what are the movements according to McKenzie we have to test uh, repeatedly, repeated movements are protrusion, protrusion of the neck, one movement and then repetition, then retraction and then repetition, then retraction with extension, all these movements I have demonstrated at the end, just I will send, uh, show the words here, then I will demonstrate at the end, retraction with extension, then lateral flexion or side bending, then rotation and flexion, these six movements we have to test and how we have to test, he has a theory. Just testing is not enough. We have to test before testing what we have to do, during testing what we have to observe, after testing what we have to do, he has a philosophy. 
and then uh, that's what he has mentioned here. So during this thing, before, during, and after the procedure, we have to accurately uh, find out the response of the patient. So he has the terminology. So at rest anyway, we are taking what is the pain level, where is this, all these things. Then during the test of repeated movements, what is the terminology? Increase means symptoms are there at rest and they have increased. Decrease means symptoms are there before the test, that is at rest only. And during movement, they have decreased in intensity. Produce means there are no symptoms at rest, but during the movement, this is not after movement, this is another technology. During the movement, you have what the symptoms. Abolish means at rest you have symptoms, and during movement, there is no symptom. Then centralizing means movement causes pain to move from, symptom to move from distal to proximal. Then peripheralization means during the movement, the symptoms have moved from proximal to distal. No effect means you have done, but nothing, no change in the symptoms or no change in the range of motion. So, address the way you are assessing and writing. During the movement, repeated movement, you have to observe this and note. Then after the repeated movements, about 10 or 12 times you do, you give 2 minutes rest and then again you have to use this terminology. Worse means, symptoms increased during the movement and remain increased after 2 minutes of rest also. So that is, uh, this is also similar to a concept of irritability of matrix. Symptoms increase and remain. Not worse means symptoms in increase during movement, but after rest they have come back to the baseline. Better means symptoms improved and after stopping also that improvement is maintained. Not better means symptoms improved during movement, after stopping the movement again he came back to baseline. Centralized same anyway, they moved from distal to proximal. Peripheralized from proximal to distal. No effect is also same. So now at baseline you have to take accurate measurement, accurate pain uh, coding words. And again during movement you have to note. And after the movement also you have to note. And then afterwards you have some algorithm you have to use. This algorithm is called as traffic light guide to symptom response before, during and after repeated movement testing. So this is the algorithm used. So pain, if it is increasing during movement and then after movement it is worse. Then this is symbol, red symbol. So suppose pain is decreasing during the movement and it is better. Better means the decrease is maintained. Then it is what symbol? Which one? What symbol? Green. That means you are doing a good job. So like that you have to make the algorithm of everything and then so red light means you are doing something wrong. So you have to change your procedure. Well, repeat, this repeated movement is not in the best interest of the patient. Green light means that movement is beneficial to him and the amount of force you are giving also is good. Amber means yellow. Yellow means you are doing a good thing but the forces are not enough. How to increase the force? So how to progress the forces also is a concept in when you are treating the patient always McKenzie says make the patient work with his own force. Don't put your hand on him initially. So that is why we always think that McKenzie is only exercise. But he doesn't stop there. Most of the patients will benefit from minimal force of his own force. When it is not sufficient, then you try to put your hand. That you see how. But when it is sufficient for him to recuperate or recover, don't try to put your hand on them and try to do manual therapy. So traffic light light, stop, progress forces, then you change the force. And if it is green, according to that algorithm, what you are doing is right, continue only those things. Next, based on this assessment, now we will uh, classify the patients in McKenzie into three groups. Subgroup 1, subgroup 2, subgroup 3, based on, as I told, symptomatic and mechanical responses. So what are they? McKenzie's classification is derangement syndrome, dysfunction syndrome, postural syndrome. These are the classifications in McKenzie. And those who don't fit into these three are called as others. So what McKenzie says is that, if they come into any of the three, our method can do wonderful job. If they go into other, then you have to follow your regular physiotherapy or you have to send the surgeon whenever it is necessary or you have to deal with the multidisciplinary team. But for the first three, you can deal with McKenzie method and get very good to excellent results. That is what the concept says. But how many patients, uh, if we take 100 patients and do a McKenzie assessment, how many patients may land up in derangement or dysfunction or postural? or how many will land up in others that we will see. Before that seeing that what is postural syndrome, what is dysfunction, what is derangement. Postural syndrome means 
patient doesn't have any pain on any test. We are doing the regular range of motion, repeated motion, nothing is there. He doesn't have any symptom. He has symptoms only when he is taking a posture for prolonged time. That means abnormal amount of stress is on normal tissue. His tissue is normal, he doesn't have any problem. Yeah, testing also doesn't show any symptoms. But he is there in a particular posture for longer time. That means abnormal amount of stress on a normal tissue. It is called postural syndrome. So only if he tells that I am uh, sitting at my uh, home and working on a laptop, after uh, half an hour I have pain here and it is radiating, it is going down. Uh, but normally when I get up and move around, otherwise when I am lying down or any other scenario I don't have much problem is they fall in postural syndrome. But uh, how many of the percentage according to McKenzie will fall into that, we will see. The next one is called dysfunction. Very clear, this classification is very clear. That means he want to demarcate the patient based on assessment. Assessment should not be like we do in BPT. We do entire assessment, but finally we will give IFT and ultrasound. So what is the purpose of doing the assessment? So if they are doing assessment also, ultimately you are going to do, that means why to waste time on doing assessment. But what McKenzie says is that if you do assessment, then you have to do specific treatment. Clear? So the second category is called articular dysfunction. Here in spine, there is only articular dysfunction. Now he has developed concepts for even how to deal with McKenzie, knee pain, hip pain, everything. There he introduced another concept called concrete dysfunction for muscles. But whereas for spine, it is only articular dysfunction. So patient comes to you, he doesn't have any pain at rest. Absolutely zero pain at rest. But when you do a particular movement, at the end of the range of that movement, he has pain. Intermittent pain means pain is not there at rest or it's not constant pain. So intermittent pain consistently produced at a restricted end range with no rapid and then the pain will not change. Pain will not move, centralization, peripheralization will not, will not be there. The patient tells that I am absolutely fine but when I am doing this movement till here, I am having the pain in the shoulder. Other than that, any other movement I am not having pain or below that range I am not having any pain. When I am going to do the movement at the end range itself, I am having the pain and if by, whether I do it more or less, the intensity may slightly vary but the pain is not going to move distally or proximally. That kind of patient we call them as articular dysfunction. Then next comes the McKenzie speciality that is called as derangement. So derangement category. Repeated movements if you do, there is a chance of decrease of movements, abolition is totally pain can or symptoms can go or there can be at least centralization of pain. Opposite also can happen. If you do the opposite movement, it can, it can cause peripheralization of symptoms. So there is, McKenzie says in the group of people when you are, who are coming for non-specific neck pain, you are having majority of people with derangement where if you do a correct assessment, then pain will move distally or proximally or pain intensity will increase with movements or decrease with movements. Then you have to identify which movement, which direction is increasing the, decreasing the pain or which direction is centralizing the pain or which direction is uh, totally abolishing the pain. So patients for whom this happens, they come under derangement category. It's clear. So derangement means pain can be there at rest or during movement or after or at end range. Anywhere pain can be there. It can be constant or intermittent. But the characteristic of that is pain can be sent, uh, changed because of repeated movements, pain can alter, it can increase or decrease. That is the derangement category. Most of the patients fall in derangement category or articular dysfunction according to you. Most of our patients fall in which category? Derangement obviously. Only few people who have pain only at the end range, they say. So according to McKenzie, many research have been done. So what is the percentage of people in each category, you will see. And others are those people, so if we have done entire McKenzie assessment, we could not uh, classify them in any of them, then McKenzie puts them in other. So uh, if they doesn't fall in our category, don't try to poke in them. With McKenzie concept, you want to poke, you poke different way. But don't poke with my method. We keep them under other category, and if it is relevant, you do other physiotherapy. Or if it is relevant, you have to send to surgeon back. If the relevant surgery is required, you have to send them. But who falls in my category, I can show you the result. That's what McKenzie says. So other subgroup what he says is serious pathology, red, red flags are all under other groups and chronic pain syndrome, chronic pain syndrome is where there is central sensitization, peripheral sensitization, psychosocial factors come into picture, people are having uh, so many contributing factors also coming into play, they come under chronic pain syndrome, that doesn't come under McKinsey category, McKinsey's treatment is not applied there, inflammatory orthopathy, where there is a severe inflammation, systemic inflammation. Then mechanical inconclusive means there is mechanical variation but that doesn't fall into one of these categories it's called mechanical inconclusive. Then mechanically unresponsive radicular syndrome where uh, maybe what Sir has told will come into picture and Sir's uh, 
RFA and other things will work to advantage of patient where those type of patient McKinsey says that you send to appropriate treatment. Then post surgery immediately you are not going to do McKinsey. Then sacroiliac is for the uh, lumbar spine. Then stenosis also. What stenosis it tells? Not the radiological stenosis. If symptomatically it is stenotic, then it, it doesn't fall under the McKinsey category. Then structurally compromised or trauma. But now we want to see how many percentage according to McKinsey will fall under other group or how many will fall in other groups, uh, McKinsey's own categories. So these are all serious, uh, these are all other group explanation regarding that. So we will not waste much time on this. So McKinsey says, and not only McKinsey, various research is done by many people and they tell when you are applying McKinsey's method on 100 people, 75 per people will fall under derangement <coughs> and you can treat them and you can give benefit to them. <coughs> 75% is a huge percentage of population who come to us. 100 people come to you with non-specific non -specific mechanical pain, either back or neck pain. Will fall under if you do appropriate McKinsey approach is derangement. Postural dysfunction is only 2.5%. Postural is only 1.2. Postural is only 1.2 means pure postural. All patients will have postural issues. But only as I told, it doesn't have any problem in the evaluation. Only if you make him sit last part of the McKinsey you make him sit for 10 minutes in the poor posture, then only symptoms will come. Those type of pure posture are only less than 2%. And other category, what we have listed now are around 20%. So, if you follow the McKinsey's approach, you can deal with 75% of people very effectively because for derangement, McKinsey works uh, very rapidly. He calls it rapid reversible treatment for neck or back pain. Dysfunction, he says, it will take time, but it's only a minority. Then postural, it is immediate. Anyway, once you correct the posture, you will have results. Other CTL, if you have some modalities in physiotherapy after like uh, uh, core muscle stabilization, uh, you respond, uh, other things you can do or you have to refer send them back to a surgeon or specialist when there is a uh, stenosis or uh, other complications which cannot be. If the pain is uh, during examination, there is centralization and peripheralization, you can deal with mechanism approach. If that is not happening, then it will be mechanically inconclusive or in the other group and you will send back to the consultant. So again, in that 75% of people, or the 100 people, how many people have directional preference? That means one movement either decreases pain or totally removes pain or at least centralizes pain. And if you really do a correct assessment, many studies have been done, that is by uh, many people, Long has done, May has done, Effort has done, and many people and everybody has told above 60%. That means approximately 70% people will have a direction where you can decrease the pain or centralize the pain or you can abolish the pain. That, that unfortunately happens to be extension and that is why we have labeled McKenzie as extension exercise. That is not his problem because patients directional preference is because of their mechanical presentation they have extension as the mechanical direction of preference then they will be free of pain with mechanic, uh, exercises or manual therapy related to extension. But other people also will be there or will have lateral flexion problem or flexion problems and they will be given exercises of lateral flexion dependent on flexion dependent. So again as I told uh, in neck pain 93% of people will respond to retraction based treatment. Retraction is not only retraction is on exercise, retraction based entire uh, gamut of treatment and only around 3% each will uh, respond to lateral flexion as well as flexion. Next, again, the postural syndrome derangement already we have discussed. This is also the same thing. Then again, there are subclassifications in postural syndrome. There is no subclassification. Whereas articular dysfunction, based on which direction they are having. In dysfunction, the name is given flexion dysfunction means if I am doing flexion like this, I am getting pain at end range. I don't have pain at rest. I am doing flexion, I am getting pain at end range. It is called flexion dysfunction. <coughs> If I am having pain at rest and I am doing flexion, pain is centralizing, then it is flexion derangement. Understood the difference? If the pain is moving, we are able to influence the pain, pain is there at rest also, it comes under derangement. If the pain is not there at rest, it is not constant, it comes only at end range, then it is dysfunction. If you have pain, pain at the end of flexion, it is flexion dysfunction. If you have pain at end of extension, it is extension dysfunction. Clear? Then derangement syndrome is also classified according to its uh, distribution. Three uh, previously there are seven subclassification of derangement that has been uh, modified into three. That is, patient is having central and symmetrical symptoms with or without distal symptoms. <coughs> pain is have, patient is having neck pain, neck and towards the scapula of both the sides, symmetrical. That comes under uh, 
uh, first category or he has up to elbow bilaterally but symmetrical up to even uh, forearm bilateral symmetrical it comes under first category second category unilateral only one side asymmetrical and up to above elbow they come under second category third category is unilateral and asymmetrical symptoms will be there in the distally forearm with with or without symptoms in the neck source is neck sp cervical spine but they may have symptoms proximally or no they will have symptoms compulsory in the distal these are the three categories in derangement now the management part i will not go into very much detail basic principles i will tell but take home message what are the exercises which we can routinely prescribe and what are the things beyond exercise what we can do in mckenzie that i will tell so principles of management so once you classify the patients into you are doing a thorough traffic light signal assessment or with the repeated movements before during and after movements assessment then you are classifying the patient based on that into postural dysfunction and derangement and now in all these three categories of patient first you will do postural change it affects on body and you correct the posture then there are only three principles of treatment i am simplifying it. Mckenzie says, means it, uh, if they are having some structural problems and it's a clear sign, you send to the other category and send to surgeon or do other therapy. Based on mechanical and symptomatic response to repeated movement, you are able to classify. Deal them with Mckenzie. Don't worry whether it is structurally what what you are able to see on MRI or other things. If he is responding to that, he is safe. If he is not responding, it is peripheralizing. Then it is. Dangerous. You have to send to the appropriate therapist. So, based on that, your classification appropriately. You have to do. You are trained person, and you are doing it classification appropriately, and use the principles appropriately. You will be able to deal with the pain. Next. So, postural syndrome. How will you treat? Nothing. First, you have to make the patient understand that there is a link between your posture, how you are sitting or standing or lying down, and the pain. When the patient understand that, oh, my posture is causing, automatically you try to correct it. till then he may have other thoughts what is the cause of pain <coughs> uh, five years back i fell down my from my bike is it the same reason people will come and tell yes sir no but when you make the cause and effect make them show that it is because of your posture that awareness is first itself is an important uh, tool of treatment then education of link between lumbar and cervical posture you have to always maintain a so all of you try to do a neck retraction try to do a neck retraction you cannot do without a maintaining proper cervical you cannot make a cervical lordosis without having a proper neck position suppose you are protruding the neck like this all of you protrude the neck can you make a lumbar lordosis now if you want to retract automatically lumbar lordosis will come now i ask you to retract automatically lordosis also is coming into picture so there is a relationship between lumbar lordosis and forward head position and other things so when you correct the retraction automatically lumbar part is also getting benefit so once you attain the correct posture you have to maintain that posture if suppose you require something you have to use a lumbar uh, pillow or uh, lumbar thing uh, to maintain the posture you can use a lumbar pillow lumbar pillow then education on avoidance of aggravating posture so once you give the idea what are to be avoided you will be happy and postural correction we can do so how exactly postural correction is done by mckenzie we will see other treatments we will not go into detail but what the method he tells is called slouch over correction posture so once now you ask the patient to slouch that means thoracic and lumbar flexion and then protrude the neck forward slouch posture with forward head no posture all of you do some activity because we are nearing the lunch time so bend forward as much as slouching and crane your neck forward as much as possible then you are aware that is a bad posture now you try to get back into hyper lumbar lordosis and hyper retraction lumbar lordosis is accelerated and retraction is also done then 10% of that you release he says that is the ideal posture so you repeat it 10 times and then you get your neutral posture you go into extreme of 
flexion, uh, slouched posture with forward head posture, then you do extreme of uh, extreme correction of your lumbar lordosis and retraction. Then you release 10 percent of that. Then you will get your your own particular, your own individual neutral posture. So again, once you teach them, you ask them to do 10 repetitions of this exercise daily for at least two weeks. And anyway, other postural instruction you are going to do, don't maintain wrong, wrong posture, keep moving up every half an hour, all these things. As an exercise, this is one of the exercises it tells you to correct the posture. Then in dysfunctions, extension dysfunction means, say suppose flexion dysfunction means if you are doing flexion movement, you are having pain. Then what McKinsey says is that, remember, postural, pure postural is less than 2%. Pure dysfunction is also less than 3%. So don't worry much. So he says that in, in dysfunction, there is adaptive shortening of tissues. That means you have some trauma after surgery. Or suppose you have uh, some problem and you are told not to do neck flexion. You are only maintaining retraction for so long. Then afterwards when you try to do flexion, there will be shortening of the extensors. Yes or no? So flexion will be restricted. That is called adaptive shortening. So adaptive shortening may be one of the contributing factors for uh, dysfunction. So in that, what he says is repeatedly do the movement which causes you pain. You have pain only at end range. Repeat that, how many times you will tell? You keep on repeating, that will remodel that ad uh, adaptive shortened tissues. That is the treatment for it. But it is only less than 2 to 3 percent of our practice according to him. Do 10 to 15 repetitions every 2-3 hours. It's not that you do it once in the clinic or only once at night or only once at whenever you eat. That is only 3 times. You have to do according to him every 2-3 hours for 4 to 6 weeks. After that for maintenance, 10, days, uh, 10 repetitions per day. So this is a long process, you have to do, if it is a dysfunction, it is not a big problem for you because there is no pain at rest. Only when you are doing a movement, you are having rest, I am doing overhead activity, inflection, I am getting pain. So you are not much bothered about your day-to-day -day activities, but uh, uh, but it takes some time to get cured, it takes about 4 to 6 weeks, but it is only less than 3% of our practice, but most of our practice falls under derangement. Derangement, we have again 3 components, that is extension principle, lateral and flexion. So once you reduce them with extension, you identify the people according to that uh, traffic light signal. If you do, you will identify which direction will give them directional preference or centralizing direction you will get. So most of them will be extension, some of them lateral, some of them flexion. If, if you find their directional preference, what to do, the exercise I will discuss later. So once you give treatment with those exercises, there will be reduction of derangement. Then you have to maintain that reduction and then recovery of function. Gradually recovery of function means opposite movement which you are avoiding. Suppose extension is the exercise you gave for one or two weeks. When you have subsided pain has decreased, then you have to introduce flexion also, that is recovery of function. Then prevention of recurrence, postural correction and what are the precautions we tell and regular exercise what to be done. So we have to prevent recurrence to come back. Like so what Salva was telling, uh, post stabilization, whatever is required to prevent recurrence, we can do once the pain has subsided. So what he says that it is not a recipe treatment of extension for all. Individualized treatment with various permutations and combinations like loaded or unloaded starting position. Say suppose if it is only extension is exercise, on assessment you have found, you have to give for neck, neck pain patient. So it is not that all patients you start and ask them to extend the neck. If there is a sequence I will tell. But for some patients you, you have to start in lying down, unloaded position. Sitting is a loaded position. You have uh, weight of the head is falling on the cervical spine. So some patients he tells that you have to start in lying down and extension. Some patients, most of the patients you can start with sitting. Or then there is uh, progression of forces. Uh, progression of forces means patient own force is doing extension. Suppose I am doing extension, neck extension. This is not the correct way, but I am just for example I am giving. If I do neck extension, it is my own force. This is a stage one. If I do extension and suppose I push like this, I am using second next level of force, but my own force. This second level. This is called over pressure. Third one, my force is also not enough. Then the therapist is pushing this. This is third level, therapist generated force. Fourth level comes the manual therapy part. The therapist will do mobilization at that part. That is fourth level. Fifth level is the therapist will do high velocity thrust. That is manipulation. Manipulation comes under the last part of mechanism. So if you are able to deal with only patient level forces, he tells don't touch the patient. And majority of patients also will heal by their own generated forces. When they are able to heal by themselves, don't try to complicate it. When they are unable to heal, then he tells you progress in a stepwise manner. Don't try to do on a uh, day first itself manual, manual therapy on him without finding his directional preference or whether he is able to abolish the pain by himself. When patient is able to do his own exercise, no, he is self-dependent. 
is independent. He can do that exercise number of times. If you are giving manual therapy means he has to come daily. Don't think that practice will decrease if the patient learn everybody exercise and they do by themselves. They will refer more patients. Understand if the patient is benefited, he will tell them more. Like how Kartik was telling about SAR to everywhere because he has benefited from SAR. So if you do a surgery, SAR may get more benefit. But SAR has done the right treatment. Now he is coming all the way from Nizamabad to here to tell about the incident. Yes or no? So if you are able to help the patient, even with a simple exercise, you give a five set of exercises and a correct procedure, and the patient is satisfied, don't think that your practice will come down. He will refer 10 patients. Understand? So that is the idea of what McKenzie says. So it is not simple extension. If only extension also, there are many permutations and combinations. And anyway, there are lateral flexion and uh, general flexion exercises also. So now I will show you the exercise that is a take home message. So you have around 11 exercises which you can do, McKenzie. In sitting position you can do 5. And one is postural correction already you have done. This 5 exercise we will discuss. So there is so much depth in the concept. But the, at least for today, if you learn how to give properly these exercises, it will benefit a majority of patients. So first one is called retraction. Exercise is called retraction. In retraction, you first ask the patient to uh, procure, say, for patients whose directional preference is extension, that is sagittal movement. Sagittal movements, what are the sagittal movements? Extension and flexion are sagittal movements. Frontal plane movements are lateral flexion or even rotation also, according to McKenzie comes under lateral component. So, in extension is the direction of preference, you have to follow these exercises. But in what is the sequence, how to progress that, I will teach now. So, first you be protrude yourself and then do a retraction. How will you teach a retraction to a patient generally? Uh, some of you might be teaching retraction exercise also apart from uh, isometrics. How will you teach the patient? Keep your fingers and push it back. Okay. Any other method? So, okay, that's fine. It should, you should not tilt your head, you should retract it properly. So, I tell my patient, so you can tell in many ways. There is a romantic way of telling, but I tell in a more professional way. Suppose if your child is coming to kiss you, your baby boy or girl is coming to kiss you, you tell them to kiss you on your mouth. You tell them, don't kiss. Tell them, don't kiss. And you take your head backward. You will get the correct position. You are taking it backward. Don't kiss. So in a romantic way, how to tell, all of you know. But in COVID times, don't go for those things. So you maintain the retraction. That is the first step. Second step is over pressure with retraction. Retraction, then your own over pressure you give. That is the second step. Next one is retraction and extension. So you have to do the retraction and in sitting position only. These are all done. Retraction, maintaining the retraction, how much ever it is possible, you have to extend and look up at the sky or the roof. All of you try retraction, maintaining the retraction, try to look up at the roof as much as possible. So that is the second exercise. First exercise, retraction. Addition to that is retraction with over pressure. Next, second exercise is retraction and extension. Retraction and extension, how will you go over pressure? You won't poke with the hand. What McKenzie says is that retraction, extension, then rotate your nose towards 2 cm on either side. It will give over pressure. That is the, these are all over pressure means force progression. I am only showing what you can, a patient can do individually. In the force progression we have, even the therapist force, in therapist mobilization, therapist manipulation, everything is there. I am not going to deal with all those things. It requires a one whole day. But basic things which you can teach the patient. Second exercise is retraction with extension. Over pressure is by moving your nose one uh, few centimeter on either side. Next exercise progression is is unloaded. Actually, for some patients, you have to start with this. If they are unable to do the exercise in the sitting position, you have to start with the unloaded position. That is, next exercise is lying down on the <coughs> couch and same uh, retraction you have to uh, lying down because gravity is not acting. It's a different exercise for the person. So because McKenzie is a mechanical approach, he is using the term traffic light, he is using the term loading. So he is like a mechanic only, he is teaching that load is in mechanical pain because of loads, whether it is an abnormal load on a normal tissue or a normal load on an abnormal tissue is his concept. So retraction and again you can do over pressure in retraction in lying down. This is the third exercise. But this exercise you cannot do here. You can do, uh, remaining exercise which you can do, I will make you do. Third, next exercise is 
retraction and extension in lying down. So for this to do, if the therapist is there, he can do, but McKenzie always believes how we can make the patient himself do. So patient has to support with one hand, the neck, bend on knee and push himself uh, out of the couch up to T3, T4 level. Up to T3, T4 level and then gently leave the hand, take it behind and then leave the hand totally and uh, let the forces of gravity act and again you look up to the sky or the roof and maintain that position and again while coming back use the support of your hand, come up. So this is retraction and extension in line. Next one. Now we are going against gravity. So this is neutral gravity, this is towards gravity, this is in prone line. Prone line extension, prone line retraction and over pressure in retraction. Next comes, these are all extension exercises. These are all basic extension exercises for neck. Then you have to progress the forces. If the patient is not extension category, then you have to go with the lateral flexion category. For a lateral flexion category patient who you have identified based on the assessment, don't give extension exercises. Start with the lateral flexion. So how to do lateral flexion? Again, retraction. All of you can do this exercise. Retraction. And then maintaining the retraction, take your ear towards the shoulder. Think that there is a pearl in your ear. Put that pearl on your shoulder. Okay? And then again come back. This is the exercise. Don't give over pressure in the beginning. McKinsey says minimal force. That is not sufficient. It is not improving the as much is required, then you do the same exercise and then you over pressure with the same side and give a pressure. This is lateral retraction and lateral flexion. Always between each exercise do retraction few times and then go to the next exercise. Next one is rotation, retraction and rotation. So retract and then same side hand. You want to do rotation towards the right side, generally towards the pain side McKenzie says to do the lateral flexion or rotation. So you are having pain on the right side, retraction and then normally do the rotation, that is normal exercise. You have to give over pressure, retraction, keep your right side hand, same side hand on the chin. Other hand from behind the head on the ear and then after going into the extension then push like this. With this hand you are pushing this way, with this hand you are pulling. Okay, that is over pressure giving. This is for lateral flexion and then rotation. Next one is same exercise in lying down. One is lateral flexion, other one is rotation, his own, own forces. Then the last one is flexion principle. If the patient directional preference is flexion, then you have to start with flexion. But generally McKenzie says that once you give the flexion, always uh, top it up with a uh, ice cream with a cherry you do, always top it up with an extension exercise at the end for flexion also. So flexion exercise, nothing but go into protracted or bad posture, from there you go into flexion. This is the starting exercise. After that, over pressure is flexion with keep both the hands and you over pressure. If flexion is your direction preference, absolutely you can use flexion exercise. So not only mechanically use extension, but lateral flexion and flexion. Then the same exercise can be repeated in lying down, that photograph I have not kept. In lying down also you can flex and you can use over pressure. So this is the diagram of uh, how the patient forces are modified. So. First, McKenzie wants patient to be independent. That is why always he starts with patient generated forces. And then next is what we have seen is patient own over pressure. Then if that is also not sufficient, if patients are absolutely uh, symptom free with patient generated force, first step, no need to go to the other steps. No need to try other direction. That's what he says. And many of them will respond. That's what he says. If that they don't respond enough, then you go to the over pressure. If still they don't respond, well, it's a minority, then you the patient therapist has to touch him. That is with clinical, clinician over pressure. Still they are not able to, the forces are not enough, you have to give for a minority of patient over pressure, that is by mobilizing the patient. And still there may be very few people who may require a manipulation and generally it doesn't encourage, but if there is few people who can, then last you have to go for that manipulation. This is called directional preference and this is called force progression and McKenzie believes in empowerment of patient and independence of the patient. So same thing again I have repeated in the diagrams, patient generated force, patient so same exercise in different methods. Patient retraction, patient overpressure retraction, how the therapist is giving the overpressure. Then therapist is doing mobilization. Then manipulation will come into picture. Then just I will I not give explanation. Other some techniques I have uh, kept the photograph for your reference. So this is how therapist use uh, manual therapy, what you call actually the therapist can do is in these positions mobilization, then manipulation, overpressure, we give traction in uh, extension retraction position, <coughs> then this side flexion. 
all these things he tells us you can do only when it is recommended don't try these things on people many people will benefit with the first step itself that's what mckenzie says and then this is the whole you can summarize what is mckenzie you can just go through this chart do the history examination and rule out the red flags send them to red flags means immediately send to the consultants neurologists or orthopedists or general medicine or oncologists if it is a cancer center next is symptoms are see they are not uh, primarily not mechanical origin then they will fall into other category if they are mechanical origin then they will come into then you will go, do the entire movement assessment movement assessment you are doing positions or movements which will have abolish or centralize positions which improve the range positions which cause uh, sustained loading based on that symptom uh, directional preference you are going to find out based on that you are doing a classification into derangement there is derangement irreducible this is there for so long but recently uh, mckenzy has uh, died in the year 2013 before that there was a discussion on this derangement irre irreducibly transferred to others uh, current description then dysfunction posture and how to treat them derangement three types we have discussed no central unilateral up to this is for the lower limb that is in knee below knee for here upper as above elbow and below elbow then uh, some techniques what we have shown here then intervention extension dysfunction flexion between the movements adherent nerve root is a special category of dysfunction where the only category of dysfunction where you have referred pain whereas other all dysfunction as i told only end range you are having pain whereas adherent nerve root which cause after surgery or trauma then uh, when the nerve, nerve root is stretched you will have pain with that was neural tension for that you have to do mobilization only not with the end range uh, patient generated exercise next is posture this is the summary of basics of mckenzie then just we will touch in one or two minutes i think so we are uh, near to lunch time already on two o'clock so i close it within five minutes so recent a lot of research i told no maximum research is there today we have ortho and neuro means ortho acl neuro means uh, spinal pain in that spinal pain maximum research is done relevant to physiotherapy means mckenzie so there are various things what they have done really research is okay you will classify according to mckenzie and we found that extension or flexion is a direct preference and wantedly we are we are giving for that patient opposite movement as a treatment to see what happens some people will give the treatment what mckenzie says based on the mckenzie assessment wantedly for other people you give opposite wantedly other group will do mixed not only single direction you give flexion extension lateral flexion in a mixed manner they have seen and they have to, uh, found out that only with the directional preference when you view you got the best result that means it has a validity the next one as i told mckenzie is expanding there are now studies where they are telling that they can treat the tinnitus that is uh, tingling uh, sound in the ringing sound in the ear also with mckenzie approach the, but i am not going to detail so we uh, talk regarding basics of mckenzie so mckenzie maybe so all of us have uh, thought that mckenzie is only about spine so i am showing some studies where they have done about mckenzie for shoulder spine today's our uh, topic one of the topic is shoulder so mckenzie has done extensive studies have been done research has been done on mckenzie's effect on shoulder related problems and there are ankle and foot complex hip and everything every uh, uh, part of the uh, body there is mckenzie's approach which it can deal with then there is one uh, related research transforaminal epidural steroid injection followed by mechanical diagnosis and therapy to prevent surgery for lumbar disc herniation as sir has told when a patient like him comes and when surgery is not necessary when sir feels in a best wishes at the sir is going to give radio frequency ablation or transforaminal injection then to prevent or delay or to avoid surgery in that case some people have mixed the mckenzie kind of approach of uh, uh, assessment and this treatment and they have found out that when the mckenzie approach shows that there is a direction preference they have best results with the steroid uh, transfer of like epidural steroid that means we are can identify people before the treatment itself who will have best results and who may not have not so good result based on this approach even the same type of thing cost effectiveness of combination therapy of mechanical diagnosis and treatment and transfer of like epidural steroid injections among patients is an indication for lumbar herniated disc surgery so even after uh, injection also there is a benefit uh, with the so that what can happen is you do mckenzie assessment he falls under non mckenzie category other category then it is appropriate for say suppose a radio frequency ablation or injection sir gives that then when, after that you assess then he comes into mechanical category then you can proceed with the mckenzie you understood no how the relationship and i can tell you uh, physiotherapy department is here and next to that is only neurosurgery department never any patient will not go 
SARS will compulsory refer and as I have told all the therapy, uh, assistant will come and they leave there from out of station also compulsory they will come and once all these procedures are over at least as I have told from the gap when they come for review compulsory they will come and if they are staying nearby minimum one week up to three weeks sir, standard is at least seven days continuously you have to go in a month for physiotherapy and the rest of the days also you have to continue what is being taught there that is a standard practice what sir says and there is a uh, good coordination with uh, ourselves and the neurosurgery team or orthopedic team and uh, we are able to achieve good result and further we will try to do some research also on these lines which will benefit uh, under the alley. Next last slide from my side. So 6C mantra for success for comprehensive management of musculoskeletal pain. So you can follow any approach, the McKenzie approach or maintenance approach or any other approach or any other type of treatment. But some of the things which on my experience I found that are useful in patient management are collaborative approach. First one is collaboration with the patient. The old concept of uh, that uh, is a therapist is an expert in pain whereas a patient is one who uh, what, what the therapist prescribes or a, a medical professional prescribes he wants to know. That is not the case. See if it is a fracture you may not need to talk with the patient. On the x-ray you can see the fracture. But if it is pain, you cannot see the pain on an x-ray or MRI. You have to talk to the patient. Then the collaboration should be there. When effective collaboration is there only, you can treat the pain. You cannot treat pain without effective collaboration. So, who is the expert in his own pain? You are expert or he is expert? So the meeting is between two experts. You are expert in about pain management. But he is the expert on his own pain, yes or no? You ask so many questions, then he should answer. If he is able to answer and he is able to aware of how to tell about his pain only, you will be able to help him. If he is not unable to or he is not able to find out about his own pain, he is not aware, you cannot help him. So collaboration with the patient is most important, whether whatever approach you follow. Second one is the concept of biopsychosocial. The old concept is biomedical concept, where uh, most of the things are done as a treat, treat and you do. But biopsychosocial, apart from only structural, which we used to see before, psychosocial and other aspects also we have to take into consideration. If you want to actively treat musculoskeletal pain, I am not talking about other things. See, suppose you want to do CABG, you can do angioplasty without much collaboration with the patient. If you do a fracture also, some of the things you can do. But with pain, when pain is involved in all of the things, pain if you want to do, deal, you have to deal with the patient. Next one is contributing factors of pain. So we always treat the source of pain. But you will forget about contributing factors. I will give you a small example. Suppose a patient has underwent a, um, say, uh, a technique from SIR or he has underwent some treatment in physiotherapy, his pain has reduced. His uh, original problem is he is a marketing person. Every day he goes 10 kilometers, uh, uh, maybe say, what is the uh, worst kind of potholes road in Hyderabad? Which area? Every area. Every area. Every area is healthy. So, so he daily goes. Uh, two, uh, two to three hours in that area on a bike. So now treatment time he is at rest or doing some exercise and he is not going to the job. So whatever treatment is being done he is alright. But again he goes in the same road next 10 days. The contributing factor is the vibrations on the road. Will he not get recurrence? And next say suppose his workplace is having a bad seat and bad arrangement of laptop or all the other thing. Now he goes back to work and again he sits in that bad position. Will he not come back again with recurrence? So these are all contributing factors you have to address. Otherwise, pain will not be comprehensive management. You can manage it temporarily. But comprehensive management, you have to take into consideration contributing factors also, apart from the source of pain. Next is communication skills. It's very absolutely essential because pain, we have to interact. As I told you, it's a communication between two experts. Then if you don't have communication skills, you have to you do not get the information from him. And even if you teach him something also, you will not be able to explain him in a better manner. Then you will be telling the best of the thing. But you don't have communication skill, you will not be listening to them in a, or you will not take the right form of how to do it. So you have to develop our own communication skills. Communication skills not only talking, listening also is a communication skill. Then apart from all these things, yes, you have to also follow the what is happening in the world, what is the evidence, what is the research. So cutting edge research is there, then you should not miss that. Say for example, last time when I presented about ACL, I have told about blood restriction exercises. Blood flow restriction exercise is the current trend of how to develop quadriceps strength in case of ACL injury. So that is being done in US. It's a simple thing. Maybe we can replicate here, but we can know about it only when we keep track of the evidence. Next, the last one is clinical reasoning. So any any anything to succeed, you have some lateral thinking also, reasoning also. You have to have the skills of pattern recognition. All these things are very important. So before we close and we are ready for the lunch, 
uh, we all will stand up once. This is about the airy and it is about shoulder and spine. So what is the airy between shoulder and spine we will see. So say suppose now we will crane our neck totally forward as much as possible and now maintaining that we will try to elevate or flex the link without much difficulty till where we can do we do. Now this is the maximum you get now. Now you retract and come to normal. Your shoulder is coming easily. So now suppose if you are stuck with your shoulder, what you have to deal? If your neck posture is corrected, your shoulder will increase. If your thorax is corrected, your shoulder will increase. That is the area between shoulder and spine. So when you are dealing with shoulder, thank you for standing up. So please be seated. So when you are dealing with the uh, distal joints, always also keep in mind proximal joints also, whether there is any contribution, how to deal with it. And a small anecdote I will tell about clinical reasoning. So once there is a surgery who came to a district hospital, sorry, we cannot use words like that. So we will tell, one Bengalappa went to a district hospital and his history is like this. I am having pain here. I am having pain here. You better know, I am having pain here. I am having pain here. Then I am having pain here. Then immediately they have taken ECG. Already they have done MRI is over. <laughs> I am having pain here, he told. Then I mean, endoscopy is also over. Then he told, I am having pain here. Then he is going on like that. People are, everything is done. Nothing is being found. They are absolutely terrified. It's a new new kind of disease where everything is painful but nothing is shown anywhere. Then one experience the uh, clinician has come around. Then they told the history, sir, that this is that years experience. Now. At this hour, also anybody have any questions? Or we will talk over coffee or uh, our lunch. We will talk over lunch. So all of you anyway know me, most of you. We will talk over lunch. Everything is ready? Okay. I thank all of you uh, for this, uh, for all the way you are coming from this far. And all our surgeons are also, and the guest also has sat throughout the program. And uh, I should say that. Now, vote of thanks will be given by Bhavya, our staff. But before that, I should say that all people are very important to make this program success. But it should not, it would not have been success but for your presence here. That's what in the last moment also, we surgeons are thinking it's a COVID time. We are having COVID patients and it is a Sunday morning. How many will respond? But the love for the profession you have and the enthusiasm you have shown. This works as a tonic for us. This Harry is in baby steps. Ishoda applied uh, advanced rehabilitation initiative is a starting step. And your feedback will give us enthusiasm to expand it into newer versions. And hope we will meet again in Yari 2.0. Thank you, one and all. <laughs> for uh, gracing this occasion because this is the first ever CME uh, opening this hall after uh, uh, 
this is built. So uh, I would like to thank everyone, each and everyone who is present over here physically and also virtually who, who people who are watching. Uh, so a little vote of thanks to the management of Yashoda and our chief guest Dr. Pavan Gorgati sir and our guest Karthik, uh, our orthopedic surgeon Dr. Veda Prakash. Dr. Neurosurgeon, Dr. Ravi Sumareddy sir, Dr. Sujata ma'am, Dr. Shashikan sir for coming. Uh, our unit head, Karthi Ganeshan sir, Vice President, Medical Services, Dr. Pavan Kulgari sir, Makesh, AVP uh, Corporate Relations, General Manager Operations, Rama Rao sir, CCTV Department, IP Department, and also the other people, Housekeeping, Security, Transport, Branding Departments, everyone, thank you. From, up, uh, from the bottom of our hearts because uh, uh, and also finally to my physiotherapy colleagues who have uh, worked very hard for the past one week to make this program a successful event. Uh, thank you so much. The, uh, the lunch has been arranged and uh, it's oppositely the appreciation of your presence here, our management has provided a small token of appreciation. Along with your certificate, you will be able to collect, all of you have to take that appreciation. Also a small bag which you can use with the Harry logo and that should be useful for you and it should be a reminder that our association, our Harry, should, you should remember our Harry when you all see that. You please collect that also after your lunch and then go back with happy memories. Thank you. Thank you.